Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. This is my uh, season review really for The Rings of Power. We've now seen all eight episodes so if you've not seen all eight episodes this is your spoiler warning um, and I am delighted that my very special guest today um, is none other than uh, Green Dragon aka Kirsten Kent, or maybe the other way around, uh, Director of Partnerships at the OneRing.net. Kirsten, do you want to say hi? Hi, Robert. Thanks for having me. Do I have to call you AKA Indie Geek? Uh, you can if you wish. That's a, w whatever works for you. That's, that's not a problem. A so, it's a pleasure. And I'm, I'm, I'm wearing my name tag just so that, you know, in that case makes me all forgets. official and everything, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, for those who do not know The One Ring, uh, what is it? Uh, what do you do? Uh, you don't speak on behalf of The One Ring as a whole, do you? You have a separate voice, but what is The One Ring? The One Ring dot net, I think we're the, the um, patriarchs, perhaps, or patriarch slash matriarch slash OGs of online Tolkien fandom. Uh, it was a website that was first established in 1998. Obviously, I'm far too young to have been involved <laughs> with it at the beginning. Um, it was set up by four people. We have four founders, like Hogwarts. And um, it was when they started hearing rumors about what was going on with Peter Jackson in New Zealand. And really following, they had um, one of their founders lived in New Zealand and did lots of spy reporting and sneaking around and and um, for a while, Peter Jackson kind of tried to shut it down and then went, you know what, I could harness this to my own ends and started working with the One Ring. So we've been around for a long time. Um, we are forged by and for fans. We've always been volunteer run. We're, you may not know this, but nobody who works for the One Ring gets paid at all. We're, wow. we're, all, we're all volunteers. We all have real, real life jobs. And um in, in its history, any time the One Ring has made any money, they've given it to a children's literacy charity in New Zealand. And I learned the other day that over the years, we've given close to a million dollars to this literacy charity in New Zealand, which I think is kind of awesome. And here we are. We're still going. We're still a fan site for all things Tolkien. Excellent. Um, well, that helpfully segues into uh, my uh, usual announcement at the beginning of these live streams. This live stream, all live streams uh, that I'm doing through the show um, are charity live streams. So Super Chats are switched off. Um, they are in aid of Alzheimer's care and research. Alzheimer's is a horrible disease. Um, and uh, this is the way that we help support people uh, who are going through that or if one of their loved ones is going through that. And research is the way we defeat this. So. Uh, what I'm saying is that if you enjoy the show, if you're enjoying this live stream uh, and you wish to show your appreciation, if you can afford it, there will be a donate button somewhere on your screen. Uh, I think last time I checked, we were up to about $6,200. If we can make that up to about $6,500 this episode, um, I would be very much appreciated. Uh, so um, that said, what did you think of the season? This is a sort of a high level uh, um, question to just kick us off. There's been a lot of talk about it. Lots of people love it. Lots of people hate it. Where do you stand on it? I'm somewhere in the middle. Uh, neither love nor hate. I enjoyed it. I definitely enjoyed watching it. Um, you know, I from the beginning, my expectation was that the sets, costumes, acting would all be fantastic. New Zealand locations we knew would be stunning. Um, whatever people said, there was no doubt that things were being done to the very highest level on this show. And it didn't disappoint in terms of visuals and in terms of the acting of the cast at all. It was exactly as I thought it would be, and I loved that. I enjoyed the story, and then of course I had nitpicky things. So I was like, really? Um, so all in all, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I would think, I think the thing, I've been trying to gauge how people have been reacting out there in the fandom and beyond the fandom, because my general perception is that my friends who are not in the Tolkien fandom loved the show. I've got a lot of geeky friends who are not Tolkien geeks who've been like, oh, it was so great, high fantasy, loved it, brilliant. Um, the people who are more upset are the, the Tolkien fans. And the interesting thing to me, though, is I haven't yet found anyone who's obsessed with it. And I think that's what it's missing. It has not yet engendered diehard fans who want to, 
you know, buy every bit of merchandise they can, etc. So um, I was hoping that I would once again be sucked into obsessive fandom as I was with PJ's movies. And I haven't been, but I did enjoy it. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, is that I, I think I would agree with you. I, most diehard Tolkien fans I know have not loved it. Um, it's probably fair to say. I know some have. Uh, that's not to say all of them uh, haven't. But um, the people who seem to be enjoying it the most are fans that I've seen have been fans of other types of fantasy who aren't deep in the lore of Tolkien and have come across this and thought, you know what, this looks amazing. This feels amazing. I don't know what all the stories are, so I'm just going to experience it. So um, I'd love actually in the chat, I, I would love just a general feel if you're there, um, just sort of drop... Um, uh, one word in uh, for how you would describe the season. I just love to get a general feel uh, from the people who are watching this live stream. What, how you would describe um, season one of the Ring of the Power. What I'm going to do though uh, for this live stream as a whole, I will frame it as I always do around questions from my patrons. I'll try and pick up as many questions from the chat as we go, and I'm going to broadly try and structure it so we go through the big plot lines that we've had in the show. So we're going to look. The Stranger and the Harfoots, we're going to look at um, the Southlands plot, we're going to look at the Elves and the Dwarves, we'll also look at Galadriel and Halbrand, and then sort of drop the P. Um, so why don't we, um, well I have a quick blip, what words are coming through now, well we got quite enjoyable, underwhelming, trash, enjoyable, interesting, fun, mediocre, riskless, uh, very bad, disjointed, mediocre, great, um, lacking, yeah, it's quite a mix, I would say, amazing, awesome, abominable. I so I, I think this is a um, uh, as I expected, th this not overwhelming in any direction. So I think it probably it's fair to say if anyone says everybody loves this or everybody hates this, I think it's probably fair to say that's not the case. Is th that's the kind of feel you've got because you've got message boards and things over on one, yeah. is that the kind of feel you're getting there too? Yeah, I think, again, the, 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 the fans, I mean, again, because One Ring's been around for a long time and we've got a lot of folks on our message boards, in our chat rooms, on our Discord, who have been Tolkien fans for a long, long time. And I think there's a, gen I would say there's a general sense of sort of disappointment, but not dislike. I think people have generally said, yeah, you know, I enjoyed it, but I was hoping it would do something more for me. And that if I had to generalize, and obviously you can't because there's a whole wide spectrum of reactions and everyone has their own taste and opinion. But if I had to generalize, it would be not dislike, but disappointment. Yeah, I think it, there's, there's definitely a feel, feeling, I think it could have done more. And by the way, just to apologize, my Wi-Fi appears to be a little bit on the blink today. So if my if my um, image goes a little bit fuzzy or something, then uh, I will be back. Do not worry. And Kirsten, like the so she is, has promised that she will uh, she will keep talking um, while I am gone. But let's start looking at the Harfoots and the Stranger, which is uh, quite a, an interesting story in structure in that it is separate from the rest of the plot. they did. There, there were moments where you could see where it sort of coincides with the rest of it. So obviously you had the sort of the uh, flaming boulder out from uh, Mount Doom, which destroyed some apple trees and things like that. But generally speaking, they never really came into contact with the rest of the plot. Um, question from the King's Road thing. G'day, Robert. G'day. Um, I was sorry to find out that the strange was Gandalf. I know you didn't want that, but I think it's more likely to excite most people than it is to disappoint. As a casual Tolkien enthusiast, I don't have any issues with this revelation. I'm sure it's somewhat frustrating for you and for very devoted Lord of the Rings fans uh, see that they went astray and they could have easily gone down paths like you'd suggested in your theories. Also, um, alas, it was still fun. So um, I want to go in a few different directions to this. First of all, um, I would love your take on... Uh, the I'd say the revelation. I don't think it was a, a, a 
complete revelation that this is Gandalf. For those who didn't get the clues, what they were trying to do was hint at it. I think it was my take. Uh, they uh, We already had, the, obviously, he's there with the Harfoots, which is mirroring Gandalf with the Hobbits. Um, he's kind of ish wearing grey. He's speaking in a very kind of wizardy accent. It has to be said very much kind of like a, a even McKellen-y English accent. Uh, and then there were a whole load of visual things, like the when he was thrown around by the staff magic. He looked very much like when Gandalf was thrown around by staff magic. He had that um, and in doubt, follow your nose line, which was a direct yes. quote from the Peter Jackson films, pretty much. Um, so they were clearly hinting at it, but I don't think they definitely said it was him. But what was your take? Do you think it is Gandalf to start with? And... It, do you like that idea or not? If it isn't Gandalf, it seems like a very cheap stunt to have him say, when in doubt, always follow your nose. Mm. You know, um, up until that point, I hoped it was going to be another Mitmaya of some variety, maybe one of the Blue Wizards. Um, it seemed fairly clear from the beginning. Actually, at one point, I really hoped that he was going to turn out to be villainous because yeah. i liked the idea of the hobbits the half that's sorry being um taken for a ride by a guy who actually was going to turn out to be maybe not sauron but some kind of dark force and uh we were putting it about i remember this was a conversation back in in the london trip in in the beginning of may about the, if it was a maya that maybe he would turn into a balrog <laughs> mm. and uh, i at dragon con on our panel there i put that out as my theory to see how many people would go with that um but joking apart uh, i even in the those hands posters that we got ages ago the gray wool was so reminiscent of at least Gandalf, but he may be just another wizard. And um, so it seemed like that was the way it was going, but they did quite a good job of walking this line of good and evil. Like well, the one thing I don't understand, if he wasn't evil, why was the fire pit that he appeared in, where his meteor hit, why was it not hot? We just in that same episode had Galadriel say, this place is so evil, our fire has no heat here. And so it seemed like a huge clue that this was an evil character if his fire had no heat. And, and yet it didn't turn out that way. So there were a few sort of misdirects that seemed a bit disconnected just to try and throw us off the scent deliberately. But Enough things like the, the talking to the fireflies like a moth, you know, um, mm. made it seem like this was definitely going to be a wizard. The fact that he's heading to the east to Rune makes, I know a lot of people said, well, then maybe he's one of the blue wizards because that's where they spent their time in Middle Earth, in the east part. Um, but again, that line of dialogue at the end, it kind of has to be Gandalf. But what's interesting to me is... Will they call him Gandalf or will they call him Olorin? Will they go with his earlier name before the Third Age? That would be interesting if they didn't actually use the name Gandalf. But I, I don't think they have the rights to use the name Olorin. So, uh, alas, but it would be interesting. Yeah, I to mean, me. the rights issues are fascinating because there, there are lots of things they do not have the rights to, but they could negotiate on a case-by-case -case basis. Right. Lots of different things. So, um, and they can... You know, people have said, oh, well, they don't have that story, but they can still be inspired in the way that they write a character. They can be inspired by all the material that's out there. They can't use the specific plot points or names without permission, but they can have a sense of, well, you know, Gandalf might have come to Middle Earth before the Third Age because there's a reference in one of the histories of Middle Earth later writings that Olorin came to Middle Earth in the First Age. Therefore, how do we know that he didn't come in the Second Age? So... I'm I'm not upset about it in that sense. I don't feel like it's ruining Tolkien's canon. I think it's perfectly possible that he was there then. I just think it would have been interesting to meet a different wizard. Yes, and the way the showrunners put it was that they couldn't imagine Middle Earth without a wizard, um, in the same way that they earlier said that they couldn't imagine Middle Earth without hobbits. Um, now, my general feel on it, I, I 
will allow them one, maybe two of those. I think if they keep on going down this route of, well, I can't imagine Middle Earth without such and such a thing, um, then that does that's quite a slippery slope to, well, we're therefore thinking that we understand this, what Middle Earth is better than the source material itself. But um, Murali was saying, will we get a full reveal of The Stranger in Season 2? I think I'm I think I'm with you that I don't think necessarily we will. I think the fact that they've said this is a wizard, basically, this isn't a star, um, and then they might just leave it with hints. They might get increasingly strong hints that this is Gandalf, but it might well be just remain hints and he will take on a name. Gandalf had lots of different names, not just Alorin and Gandalf, but Mithrandir and many other, the Great Pilgrim, lots of different names across Middle Earth across the ages. So he could have a completely different name. As for the blue wizards, yeah, I was I was hoping if this was a wizard, this would be a blue wizard, but we need two blue wizards for that uh, to be the case. They were talking did right that there were the two blue wizards were there in the second age, so that's entirely possible. Um I my biggest thing that I just really want them to explain is whoever this person is, if they did come from Valinor why didn't they just come by boat that's the thing i just don't understand is that well, and yes that, it looked cool but really that was a weird thing as well because we're on re-watching that the the scene in in the first episode where they're um or yeah it was in the first where they're sailing towards valinor and that whole thing was weird don't get me started on that but and the sort of gray rain curtain of the world rolled back why in the second age but and they all burst into spontaneous song and it looked like some revival meeting um it was at that moment that the meteor left valinor and it almost implied that normally it, the gates are shut, which again is weird in the second age, but, and because they were opening for a moment to let Galadriel and the other elves through, this being seized his opportunity to escape from Valinor in a meteor, that sort of, and that's why for a while I was thinking, well, maybe he is going to be the big bad. Maybe this is, um, Sauron, Anatar, having repented and gone back to Valinor, but not really repented, seizing an opportunity to escape and make his way back to Middle Earth. That meteor makes much more sense to me if if that was who it had turned out to be than if it's a wizard. I mean, I like it, but I still don't. It's the the meteor propulsion unit that gets me. <laughs> Is that, what was this like a big catapult firing a meteor across? Because that for me that. I mean, I, I also bought into the, I, the, this looks like a Balrog after about three episodes, I thought the evil symbolism is there, the fire symbolism, symbolism is there, the Maya symbolism is there. This adds up to being um, a Balrog. I did change my mind a little bit later on. Um, yeah, but I did too. That, that was the, the, the reasoning I had was that this could arrive from space because a Balrog, at the end of the first age, Balrogs, uh, dragons, Sauron, a few orcs, all kind of, they, they scarpered. They just hid. They tried to get away, made sure people couldn't track them down. And maybe I could see, see a Balrog could have escaped out to space somehow. I could, I could kind of buy into that. It's a bit weird, but I could buy into that. And this was in coming back down. Um, but coming from Valinor by yeah. you know, big meteor catapult didn't that didn't work for me I suppose the only thing is because uh Gandalf Olorin in his early Maya days was very much associated with fire and light maybe they thought that that might be his chosen mode of transport I don't know <laughs> I, d I don't know I could probably talk about uh, the meteor transport more than for probably a whole live stream i it, it, it bugged me more than it probably should have done but we we can uh, we can move on a little bit um bill c welcome to the members club uh thank you very much for that uh and andrew k uh, i have put it on slow mode now i hope that uh that solves the problems um if you are there in the chat um the moderators do a fantastic job if you could just show them a little bit of appreciation um they absolutely deserve it keeping the place safe for everyone to uh, to be uh, having their views um and sharing them so um let's look at this from a slightly different angle now we've got um the the, the reveal that this is uh a, an star a maya and is now heading east now 
if I had more technical ability, I'd now bring up a map of Middle Earth. But you can imagine it if you want. You've got the Misty Mountains in the middle. To the right of that is Mirkwood. That's where they are right now. It wasn't called Mirkwood. It was called Greenwood at the time. And they're now heading east from there. Uh, clearly, the action at the moment is off in the Misty Mountains where Khazad Bim is just to the other side with the Region. Linden's even further that way, more doors down south. So they are moving away from the action. Um, why? <laughs> but do, do, you, do you have any concept of what might be going on here, what they might be doing over there? I really don't. And I found that very weird because I found it weird that Nori left her family I, the whole thing about no one walks alone. Okay, I'm going to go off on my own. Bye. That was strange to me. If no one walks alone, why is she? I know she's leaving with the stranger, but why is she leaving her family like that? Almost certainly from the implication never to see them again. Weird. Um, mm. I didn't really understand what 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 he's look i mean i know there's this premise that they're looking for these particular stars and there's for some reason he's got to go to where those stars are but what that would be and why set up a sort of buddy road trip movie between nori and the stranger slash gandalf slash wizard I don't, that really seemed very strange to me. By the way, I totally called it that Lenny Henry was going to die. That was, I, <laughs> I was 100% sure that his character would not survive season one. So that came as zero surprise to me. Um, but yeah, I really, that sort of baffled me. I, you know, I like, I really like the Harfoots as characters. I have really enjoyed the way that they've been portrayed. I haven't had, the issues with them that I've seen some people expressing. I thought they were charming and I could completely believe them as sort of nomadic ancestors of the more settled hobbits that we meet in the Shire. Um, and I, again, I thought well acted. I th again, I, I don't have any problems with the acting in this show. Um, so I enjoyed it. I think I particularly like Poppy as a character. And so I thought it was a shame to leave her behind. I'm sure we will see her again. I'm pretty sure that actress mm. is hired for more than season one. What is it? Megan Fellows, I think is her name. Um, yeah. And um, so I, I enjoyed all of that. And I liked the interaction with the stranger. I think Daniel Wayman does a fantastic job in that role. But I don't, I cannot imagine why there is some particular constellation that he needs to see in the East. What For what? I no clue could he be is he meant to be i suppose he's meant to be finding aid for middle earth if if the fear is that the dark is rising again um he is meant to be counteracting that but what could he be looking for in the east that's like the magic weapon to counteract that i i don't know yeah i, I can my best guess is that this is he is being sent off to the east to help out in some way and in the east this is um where the morgoth's heartland was effectively still as in what is left of it um this is the easiest ground for sauron uh, canonically to be uh, gaining support amongst the men uh, so that's where the blue wizards went and they went and they sort of did things behind the scenes and just foiled a lot of Sauron's plots. We just don't really know about it. Tolkien, we talk a lot about the blue wizards for actually about two sentences of what Tolkien said. So uh, right. we, we shouldn't over, over egg what this is. This is a passing reference in one of his later uh, writings to, to the blue wizards being there. Um, so I can only assume, yes, he's got, here's a star map, go to this place and just, be you and do good things. Um, that does lead to the question about who who these uh, the mystics are, the, the the three strange cultists mm -hmm. who came in because they have the same star map, um, which is that seems to be like and here's some stars from our homeland, um, and they were looking for some. They thought this was Sauron returning, uh, but it's actually the other which, if it is Gandalf, kind of elevates him to an anti-Sauron position, um, which he didn't really have in, in Tolkien's uh, world. They were sort of, they were both 
my art, but they weren't sort of opposites, uh, so to speak. Right. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, sort of explaining that I think they still need to do or, or unwrapping layers of the onion, which is the way that they um, uh, like to, Lindsay Webber, the right. executive producer, likes to refer to it as that. Uh, quite a fun comment here in the chat. Uh, HIA saying, what if the Astari... Um, are repentant beings, maybe Gandalf is paying penance for being a Balrog, uh, <laughs> which is a, a fascinating way of if we've got uh, if we've got Sauron who's being penitent in season one, maybe this is what it is. Maybe we were right about getting all of these kind of evil signals, and actually it is the hobbits who are pulling uh, a, an evil Balrog towards being a good Maya. Um, yeah, I like that idea. That's that's quite good. As for Poppy, um, yeah, uh, Mara Lee also said every uh, Frodo needs his Sam. Do you see Mori, uh, Do you see Nori being reunited with Poppy? Yes, yes. I do. Absolutely. I I think uh, I, that character, out of all of, to be honest, out of all the Halfords, that's the character, and that's the the relationship between those two is the the bit that I liked the most. Um, and I think that they will they will find some reason for. For her to set out and try and find Nori or something along those lines, so yeah, yeah not not too sure about it, but it seems a bit. Uh, although the hints are maybe we're not going to get so much half foots in season two, from what the showrunners have said, uh, I think we will definitely see some of Poppy. Is there anything else in that uh, whole um, half foots and stranger storyline that you want to pick up on before we move on? I don't think so. I'd like to come back to Balrogs at some point, but I don't think I have anything else in particular about Harfords. And, and like I say, I did. that was not a part of the show that I really had any particular issues with, though I was hoping it wouldn't turn out to be Gandalf, but now I'm pretty sure it is Gandalf. What kind of Gandalf remains to be seen. <laughs> yes, yes. Proto-Gandalf. Let's, let's call him that. Um, uh, okay, let's... Uh, so, uh, Nicole... Um, this Neues, thank you very much. Welcome to the Members Club. Let's, if you're wanting to talk about Balrogs, I'm going to assume that's with sort of the Caldoom uh, angle, so uh, we can come back to that uh, when we're talking about that. Um, but let's, uh, well, let's, just, let's talk. Can I just go on. pick out a little thing that I just saw going by on the chat? Um, yeah. Sword of the Morning just said that he wondered if the wheels would become Hobbit doors, and I really like that because I, I love that they kept referencing these wheels. Um, and so I think that's a nice call. Maybe that's what become the the Hobbit hole doors. Yes, I, I like that too. And um, uh, quite a few people have sort of suggested maybe they're going to end up in the Shire. I think they won't end up in the Shire, but I think they may well end up in the Anduin Valley, uh, mm -hmm. which is where the the early Hobbits that we know of uh, were. So um, I think that may well be uh, where they end up, and then it's going to them settling down um having spent you know all their time on their migrations and finally realizing hey it's quite dangerous doing all of this migration business why don't we just settle down somewhere we know is safe so i think that's probably where that arc is going to end up but let's talk about the the dwarves and the elves um i mean first of all let's let's talk about the dwarves generally because i think I'm not alone in thinking that this was one of the strongest parts of the season. Uh, Jacob Roche, or possibly Jakob Roche, saying, Hi, Robert. Uh, thanks for the content. You're welcome. Which relationship or storyline have you enjoyed most this season? For me, I really enjoyed Durin and Deesa, and King Durin and Durin, and Elrond and Durin. So a big Durin fan here. I feel like we should have seen more of the dwarf storyline and even more of the splendor of Khazad Doom. And 444 saying, uh, My general impression is that the writers focused more on the orcs and dwarves um so did you what was your take on the dwarves because this is one thing that the story the uh, the showrunners did come out beforehand to say that one of their aims for all of this was to give a little bit extra grandeur and depth to dwarf civilization that perhaps we've not seen in other adaptations of Tolkien's work do you think they succeeded in that yeah I do I thought uh, and it's interesting because the dwarves generally seem to be the bit that most people like. Even people who are not thrilled with the show say, apart from I like the stuff in Casa Doom. So that does mm. seem to be the general vibe out there. 
Um, Kazadu looked glorious. I loved that shot when Elrond first arrived there and they were leading him in. That was really fun to see. And there was like the little terraced bits of planting going on and um, some really cool detail in the design. Very well cast acting, you know. Um, the, uh, a wine and um, Sophia are fantastic. I was actually really moved by his performance in the last episode, A Wine, as as Durin Four Prince Durin. I thought he was terrific. Um, I do wish that they hadn't felt the need to do any of the dwarf belching or dwarf <laughs> almost swearing in front of elves type stuff. I just I don't really see the need for any of that apart from it's what Peter Jackson did. You know, I mean, I know obviously they're different cultures and the dwarves are a sort of more rugged, if you like, square, solid culture than the, the fluid elves. But I I don't, I really, those are the bits I hate in PJ's movies are the sort of jokes about squirrel droppings and gimli belching and all of that. And I wish they hadn't done any of that. But they did steer us away from that to see more of the sort of heightened dwarfish culture. And I thought it was very well done. I, I don't love the mithril plot I, I do have some issues with the plotting where it comes to and i don't want to go off on a rant <laughs> well well do go off on a rant because i we, we people will want to talk about mithril so feel free to go off and and, and if this links into what you were talking about the balrog as well then then go for it yeah well two issues one is it seems very odd to me that it looks like they hinted at a story which happens in the third age and doing exactly that story in the second age, this idea of mining for Mithril wakes the Balrog. Um, it, did the Balrog just hit snooze and go back to sleep till the third age? Is that, I mean, you know, so that was weird to me because I was like that, to take a very specific plot point from the third age and move it into the second age, odd. If they're not going to go any further with that, then that is a cheap stunt to be like, ooh, look, Balrog, now we'll leave him alone till the Third Age. So that was odd. Um, I did say to someone weeks and weeks and weeks ago, the bit of the Balrog in the trailer might be the only bit of Balrog we actually get in the show. And that was almost how it mm. turned out to be. Not quite, but almost. Um but I don't, I had two issues. One, I didn't like the fact that the Mithril sort of glows with its own light, because as far as I'm aware, Mithril is always described as a metal which reflects light, not that has its own internal glow. So right back in the beginning, when it was like opening a box and there was something in there that was glowing and we were trying to guess what it is, and people said, maybe it's Mithril. I was like, well, it can't be because Mithril doesn't glow like that. So that was a little weird. And then just this whole idea that, it, it was very much to me like Ar Arwen's life being tied to the fate of the ring in PJ's movies where I was like, what? This mm. idea that the elves are going to fade away and die if they don't bathe in the light of Mithril. I, mm, I, I don't mind the show writers taking their own plot points, their own storytelling, but to actually include some new significant piece of law, that doesn't feel right to me. No, I would agree. Um, I I think, I won't have many thoughts on this, um, uh, many different rants I could go off on, uh, but I think one of, one of the angles that I go, go with this is that for me, if you were talking about restoring the, the, the pride and glory of the dwarven culture that is mithril and that's because this is the thing that they have found this is the thing that they've managed to uh, extract and they've managed to do great things with it this is the source of their uh, riches and and the the wonder of Kazadun. and to turn that into effectively just a subplot of what's going on with the elves um it's only there because somebody dropped a great elf artifact into a tree above the, the Misty Mountains. That kind of diminishes it for me. Um, yeah. One thing I will say is for those of us who don't like this much, there is still a glimmer of hope. They, they did... 
sort of suggest that this was the truth or there's some truth to it by having the piece of mithril cleaning up that leaf but uh, the showrunners did um i think it was in hollywood reporter i i tweeted it if you want to go and have a look back it, it was a couple of days or so ago uh, they did a really interesting interview there and one of the showrunners said uh, oh yeah so we just thought this would be really cool we can tie up all these different elements here we've got the silmarils we've got mithril we've got uh elves fading we could just make this great plot tying them all together uh, and then the other one i wish i could remember which way around but the other showrunner says yeah but do do you remember that this is elrond said this is just an apocryphal story and he does know his law so i think there is another twist to come in that story i think there is another thing they're wanting to show us i i do not think that they will stick maybe i'm being too optimistic i do not think that they will stick with this idea that the elves will all fade unless they have to bathe, unless they do get to bathe in mithril because they don't and that's just not something that happens they survive this they they keep going they will not all disappear in season two and they're not all going to get to wear mithril crowns or rings well, or anything like that Interestingly, um, had it turned out that Anatar had already been in uh, Linden or in Eregion, and if it hadn't turned out to be Halbrand, which I know we'll get to later on, um, then I think it would have been easier to buy that and be like, oh, well, he has just somehow implanted this idea or led them to believe that this is the truth of the matter and he's manipulating them some way. So I do take your point that it may end up to be not entirely true i also do get the idea that of sort of life forces being tied to rings after all we know that sauron's life force is tied to his ring um and so i don't object to the idea of there being a sort of life-giving energy to these rings and um tolkien did it was a theme of his that elves when they were in middle earth when they chose to stay in middle earth were always fading. Even in the Second Age, there's this sense that, you know, he went, one of his let letters that he wrote to um, his friend, what was his name, Milton, can't remember his last name now. Um, but yeah. this idea that the elves flourish in Valinor and in the West, they're always sort of surrounded by this sense of sadness and of time passing and of things that decay of a world that in a way they're not part of because they're not supposed to be things of that decay but there's always this kind of theme of fading so i don't even mind the fading thing too much um it just seemed too extreme sort of tying it all together and being like if we could just do this this deus ex machina would make everything fine you know so it's in a yeah. way it was sort of oversimplified and it's all uh, it's the the timing is the thing for me is, is i i agree absolutely the elves fading is completely this is what tolkien wrote about this is definitely there but not we will fade within three months right um, that's by, not by next spring that's there it's that they survive for a thousand years and then suddenly they're all going to fade in three months and why is it that nobody can sit if they were about to fade why is it that elwyn's not there going oh i'm feeling a little bit thin or something i mean uh, <laughs> exactly i mean nobody else other than gil gallard seems to think that this is a thing um so um there is another layer here um i agree with you completely i was and until we got episode eight and all of the reveals there i was very much up with this idea that anatar had already been to oregion he planted this idea this was what he wanted to do was he wanted to uh, get a big uh, forge built uh, hence him getting that and he or nipped off the other thing he wanted was the, some mithril out and so he tried to get it so that the elves were desperately going to go in there and uh, get some out from the, the dwarves and the dwarves would help them i thought that kind of worked for me but it doesn't appear that that's the case right so we'll we'll have to wait and see there is a, there's another layer there um i want to talk about mystery boxes later because this is a, a big thing uh in terms of the overall structure but um this is clearly the way that the showrunners want to do this they will give us a little bit of the mystery and then a bit later they will give another bit of the mystery and then we should be able to look back and go ah now i understand what was going on there so if we're giving them credit we have to say okay uh, at some point we will learn more about this um, and this is important 
as well as many other reasons, because it also ties into the character of Gil Gallard. And, and that, for me, is the, the character that I felt most distant from the character that I know, in that mm. he seems he seems to have given up, he seems not to have much hope, he seems not to be particularly wise or foresighted, um, he doesn't seem to trust people, um, he seems to be pushing Elrond to be breaking his words, that none of this seems to work with me for who Gilgalad is, particularly when he is in, in the books, he's the person who first saw, spots that there's something going wrong down in the southeast and in, in east of, uh, of uh, Middle Earth. He should be the person who is there most on the ball about this, but actually he seems to be not. He seems to be yeah. most misled. Yeah, um, I mean, he, he just came across as a horrible boss, basically. <laughs> he, just, he did. He did. Uh, he, yes. Uh, that was very disappointing to me because this was really potentially he's the the kind of highest noblest elf that we've yet seen on screen um and it was a i think a real opportunity to to show us and he's the one in all the when everyone was upset about short-haired elves he was the one in all the promo materials that had the long hair and you know maybe looked the most regal and 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 again great costuming um so there was potential for this to be a really fabulous noble character and i really wanted him to be and he just was a bit of a dick um yes he was um so question from diego godoy saying hola robert hola um, could you please explain how creating those three rings of power will help the elves in their current situation i feel like they didn't really explain this in spite of the name of the show itself um I don't think they did explain it fully, um, so I don't think you you missed that. Um, the idea, the in-show idea, uh, very clearly seems to be that Mithril is the thing which will help stop uh, the elves from fading. If you get enough of it, then you might help stop all of the elves from fading. Um, they wanted it in this ring because it would then sort of bounce off against itself or something. I can't remember the exact phrasing they used, but this sort of amplified it in some way. And they, the idea was that, uh, okay, they've now got enough and they can make three rings. Now, the three rings um, in Tolkien's world, they do have these powers of preservation. Um, that is very clear. And they're powers not just for that person, but they are powers for the area that they're in so this is what keeps places like Lothlorien like it is uh, because Galadriel has it she's staying there and it's protecting that area and it's preserving mm -hmm. it against the ravages of the outside world against Middle Earth and when the power of the ring has gone that's when uh, Lothlorien itself will just sort of decline so there, there is that seems to be what they're going for these are things which will help uh, the elves so I don't know whether they then logically, if they think this is what's going on, they would put on those rings and go to the places where the elves are. And hopefully that will um, help save a few elves from fading. But they didn't they didn't go into the details of how this works because this is very vague about the fading and the tree getting the gunk on it and things like that. It's um, as a result, the if the problem isn't clear, then the solution itself isn't here. so i think that's the world we're in at the moment um but these are good and that they they will help even the show's uh internal logic um but is there in terms of the the forging of those three rings did what what did you think about that did you did you like it do you think that was this was basically this was the end of the season the thing they were building towards was the forging of those three rings did that work for you um I was very relieved that Halbrand left before they finally forged them because I was very discomforted by him being involved in the forging of the Elven Rings at all because unless I have overlooked and missed something in the law, um, he encouraged the forging of the Rings of Men and the Rings of the Dwarves um, 
and encouraged the elves to make other rings. But my understanding was always that he didn't know anything about the making of the three elven rings. He might have had an awareness of them because they were all in some way tied to his one ring, but that they were made in secret from him, I thought. Um, so I didn't love that he was there when they were starting to make them. So then I was relieved that at least they kind of had this idea that he told them to make two and they, he wouldn't know that they'd made three or something. So they did at least sort of stick to the idea that we're going to have these be independent of his Machiavellian plan. Um, so, OK, fine. I thought they looked quite cool. Um a bit clunky they weren't exactly beautiful which was a pity because again you all this thing about elven smiths and the incredible artistry of them and it was just like here's a uncut rock of a gem that we're just going to stick in this ring so it did feel a little bit rustic for keller brimble's work and for what they were doing so i'm not sure that i loved the look of them um i think I've seen people asking questions uh, about, are we going to see the Dwarven rings being forged? Are we going to see the rings of men being forged? Or is that just going to happen off screen? I'm sure we're going to see it. I mean, they've got five seasons of rings of power. You know, maybe another season will be all about how they forge the rings that are then given to the dwarves. Maybe another season will be all about how they forge the rings that are given to the men. They're obviously kind of spreading it out. Um, so, that's a little odd that the Elvish rings are made first. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if it's very far on down the seasons before the one ring actually gets forged. Um, so, you know, we'll just see how, how that unfolds. But I, yeah. I mean, they've, the, the showrunners have basically confirmed that, that we will be getting the other rings. They've not forgotten about them. Right. Um, so that's, that's a thing which will happen. Um, I do, I, th I suspect that they will go with the fact that he forges them with Keller Brimbor, which does make me think that perhaps uh, Galadriel's not going to tell Keller Brimbor, hey, by the way, this guy's Sauron, um, because otherwise it seems a little bit unlikely that he would um, allow him back in and they'll do a little bit more forging. Um, so uh, Why the, the, the thing... Tell him? That was weird. When she went back in, why didn't she tell them, holy shit, he turned out to be Sauron? I didn't get that. When she says to Elrond, you just have to trust me, basically. And he's like, you're making it difficult for me to trust you. And I'm thinking, yeah, why don't you just tell them? Yeah, I, I would agree. I think I think she should. <laughs> I think, And if she has learned her lesson, which I think is what they're wanting us to believe from this, is that she's she's been chastened and she's heading towards the path to, to wisdom. Uh, this would be a good moment to show that by her uh, opening up about what happened rather than keeping it as a guilty secret, which seems to be what uh, she is doing. Um, in terms of the order of the rings, one thing which I think they will need to do is uh, work around the idea that yeah. Sauron, when he worked with Caleb Brimble, he taught him how, the, how to do ring magic, so how to make the magical rings. They're not just making pretty rings out of a particular substance. They're magical rings. And obviously, he is uh, secretly making these rings be linked to the ring that he's about to make later. Uh, so that is why, when later on, why the order is important, because when he nips off and the three elven rings um, are forged by Caleb Brimble, he's doing them separately. This is him on his own without Sauron, so these are good rings. However, because he's using the same techniques that he's been taught by Sauron, the link is still there between those rings and the one ring. So that's something they need to work out, is how can you possibly have uh, a link between the one ring which has not yet been forged and three rings which have already been forged it would seem before he's even come up with the whole ring plot uh, and then mm. these other rings that he's going to be producing in a little while how do we actually get that thread of magic tolkien's never very specific about what sort of magic is and how it works but clearly this is not just a let's do a good alloy and that will make a nice ring uh this is we're injecting some magic into this in some way so they will need to work through that and so, uh, so that we get link between those three rings and the one ring um 
but I think yeah, I people seem to like the in the chat the idea of the the, the word rustic. It is a it's a good word. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, I I also it's a very small thing. I, I wish they'd used cut stones rather than uh, just a raw uh, un, uncut uh, uh, gemstones. Um, random. I saw, oh, sorry. sorry, I saw I saw a few people in the chat saying that it's Galadriel's pride that meant she didn't mention oh shit he's sauron and absolutely 100 percent. It, it's she's ashamed that she is the one who's kind of vouched for him and brought him there and all of that so mm. totally um i i understand that motivation but boy that's an epic mistake on her part i think it, it is um and and at the risk of going into sort of talking about galadriel and hellbrand i think one of the the biggest issues i have with that bit of plot line is the way that this takes uh what happens with Galadriel later in the Lord of the Rings and it actually makes that that great moment of testing it kind of diminishes it because this isn't actually her being to her her uh, sort of lust for power being tested she's already passed that test mm -hmm. back here in the second age she's been given the opportunity to have power she said no so she's not actually had that character formation during the third age uh, leading up to that and actually what most of what happens in that scene in the lord of the rings is her in the show world quoting what sauron said to her in the first place um so this actually wasn't her being tempted this is just her remembering what sauron was doing and mm -hmm. it sort of turns this into a revenge mission by galadriel um uh, against sauron which i'm not sure i particularly like that as a as a dynamic for her um I could sort of buy the shift in motivations, which is quite a big shift from her being her pride being based around wanting to rule, which is what Tolkien was very much uh, saying was her big downfall, and her pride being based around wanting to get revenge on Sauron, which is what it is mm -hmm. on the show. Um, but for it to be the the same thing to go on all the way through. Uh, that doesn't quite work for me. I, I, th I think the idea that she remains um, with this chip on her shoulder about what happened with Sauron all that time ago doesn't doesn't sit right. But we were talking about the dwarves, so um, let's. Um, uh, George R. R. Tolkien's got a question saying salutations, Robert. Salutations to you too. I wanted to ask about the dwarves. Um, how come the dwarves uh, might come about letting Celebrimbor create the Melon Gate? Uh, and do you think we'll get to see it created? So for those who don't know, the, the Melon Gate, this is Durin's Gate, the, the, the great west gate of uh, Khazad Doom. You will remember it from the Fellowship of the Ring. This is one the Fellowship are all uh, hanging around outside. They're trying to figure out what the password might be. Uh, and eventually Gandalf goes, ha, Melon. And then it all opens. Melon is, of course, Elvish for friend. And it is literally um, saying say the word friend and come in. So as a slight digression, what this actually is very, very strong in-world evidence for that Tolkien, he didn't have to tell us this, but show us that that actually is not a password to keep people out. That's actually uh, say a way of saying, welcome elves, you can come in. All you have to do is say you're a friend and the door's open for you. Um, so the relationship there at that moment in time between Celebrimbor and Eregion and the dwarves of khazad was very strong. It was open access. They could come and go as they liked. Um, now, that clearly isn't the case so far on the Rings of Power. Um, Celebrimbor has not even been inside. He's always wanted to see inside and he's never been there. Um, but that gate is, uh, if you actually read what it says above it, it says this was basically, it was jointly made by Celebrimbor and the dwarf Navi. So they were making that together. So I am i don't know how they're going to get to that point uh, from where we are at the moment with the dwarves having shut the doors and not really wanting to talk to the elves to a point where they're presumably within the next few episodes where they're creating a door that says elves are always welcome come in mm -hmm. um have you got any ideas how that might come I about think it, i think it's uh, i think it's going to be to do with the passing of, of power in casa tomb i have a feeling that during three may not be long for this world uh in the show 
and if if Durin Four becomes the king, then he is an elf friend, and I think it's that conflict that we've seen between the two Durins at the end of this season um, that may continue on a bit. But I just have a feeling that Peter Mullen's character is being set up to pass on fairly soon, and and then that's quite simple. Um, if if Durin Four comes to power then he is absolutely going to want to welcome the elves back and mine for me through and all of that stuff. So I just, I don't see that being a problem. And I, I think we will see Na'vi as a character and I'm looking forward to that. Okay. I like, I can buy that completely. That, that works. I, I find it a shame because I think Peter Mullen Durin senior is, I think the best dwarf I've seen on screen. I think he's absolutely nailed it. I thought that he's he's got gravitas. Uh, he's he's got that slightly grumpy tone to him, but at the same time, not in a way that you sort of laugh at it. It's it's yeah. just a part of his character. So um, yeah, I, I think I think that works quite well. They will, I think, have to introduce us to some more dwarves though, because basically they will. The moment, and I, I do wish they hadn't made Peter Mullins. Uh, Durin Senior, quite such a sort of bad guy towards the end there. You know, it, it's I, I like the conflict. I like the father-son conflict. I like the idea that he has a different opinion about how they should deal with elves and all of that. But it, it went a bit extreme, I thought, when he like pulled off Durin's collar and chucked it away. And, and I thought, oh, he's because he's such a noble character and again it's a little bit like Gil Galad being the horrible boss it's sort of do we have to reduce him to the bad guy so that we're happy when his son comes to power and we get rid of him it's more interesting to me if if there's more shades of gray there and I think they went a bit far with his aggression towards his son in that conflict that they had at the end of the season yes and it does it also link back to the the Balrog uh, conversation we're having a bit ago because when he goes which I agree he probably will at some point but when he goes then what is Durin Jr and and Dito what are they going to be doing they've already set this up they're going to go digging for some mithril so the having shown that the Balrog is there they basically have to go one of two ways with this, I think. Either just like they only showed us that because they wanted to show that they know that there's a Balrog there, that that'll come up later, and to show that Durin Senior did have a point, so he's not just being uh, grumpy and annoying, that there was some reason why they shouldn't be going there. That is there. Or they are going to bring the Balrog plot forward, which kind of makes more sense in the light of what they've been doing. But... I think it depends on if they want to keep the dwarves in the story for a while. Because so far they've had, and, and I, I'll try and say this without it sounding as quite as, uh, as damning as it is, they've had one season of actually no progress in the dwarf plot. Because they're exactly where they were to start with. Durin Senior is still in charge. Uh, they're not actually developing, sort of mining much for the the, the Mithril. Uh, the doors are still shut to to elves. Um, and Durin Senior and Disa are there, just sort of a little bit annoyed with not being in power. They've not actually moved forward at all. Mm -hmm. um, if if in if they're going by what happens in uh, Tolkien stories in the Silmarillion, then you get a little bit further along the plot and the, the dwarves shut the door. And they're not really heard from again for most of the, the rest of the Second Age. They are, right. they're there, and a few of them we get told that some dwarves did appear in, in various battles, but they don't play a big role in anything that mm -hmm. happens. So they will have to come up with some sort of plot for them and I think that they probably have decided well let's do the mithril thing leading to the Balrog and have that happen earlier and that Balrog is going to be called Durin's Bane and so if we've got a Durin here already I do wonder whether they will pull everything together and say this is the Durin that's Durin's Bane I don't yeah, know that's interesting. That and I do yeah as you mentioned earlier of course they 
the Tolkien estate can give them permission for things. And so it's just interesting because one of the things that seemed to be pretty clear early on uh, with the estate's involvement was that they were not allowed to screw with the chronology of what Tolkien wrote. And that seems to me a quite a massive thing to take an event from the third age and put it in the second age. But then I guess if the estate went, yeah, all right, then they could do it. Yeah, well, I mean, they've taken potentially Gandalf from the third age and put him in the second age. So I don't think there's a, a reason why then not to do that. that. My only difference there would be Gandalf could be in the second age and it doesn't affect him being in the third age. But if you wake up the Balrog in the second age, you can't wake him up in the third age. So you're actually moving the story as opposed to adding to the story. Yes. And I don't disagree, but I think that they've made bigger changes to the law than that already. I mean, I think sure. the, the the fact that we, we have Valinor as being something that is a reward for good behaviour for the elves is and, and Gilgalad yeah. is gatekeeper oh. to Valinor is is huge. Um, Don't I get me started on that. <laughs> <laughs> this, That's this, the this, one this... bit of the show that really bothered me. So. Yeah. And it's uh, for, for those who aren't Tolkien nerds, then that probably you, you go, well, that's not a big shift, is it? But in terms of the, and I don't know, the theology may or may not be the right way of saying it, but in terms of the meta understanding of how Tolkien's world works, that was a huge shift um, and changes everything that we, we know about the nature of, of Valinor and elves and their relation to the world and lots of different things. So um, if, if, they can, if they're willing to do that, then I think that they're probably willing to do something that, frankly, 99% of the people watching the show will have no idea when Durin's Bane uh, awoke and when he chased the dwarves out from uh, Bordia. They'll just know that that happened at some point. So I, I think they they could do it. Um, we're about uh, an hour in, and this is the point at which um, I always say, patrons, thank you so much. Uh, I cannot do what I do without your support. So that's why I frame all of these uh, live streams around your questions. If you would like to support the channel, the best way is through Patreon, link down there. But I see we're up to 6,300 now. Uh, thank you very much. If you have been donating, uh, I hugely appreciate it. I'm very sorry that I can't uh, read out everyone's name as they go past the chat. Let's go through too quickly to spot everyone. One, but if you have donated i hugely appreciate it and if you are enjoying the live stream and you can afford it um i would love you to show your appreciation by uh, clicking on the donate button um i did uh, also curse now i just wanted to also give you an opportunity while we're sort of halfway through um you're not just a tolkien uh, geek are you you also have a, a another life um doing do. wonderful musical stuff um what if if people wanted to and I think it's in sort of New York part of the world, isn't it? That if people wanted to get access to some excellent music, where might they go? Yeah, the, the geeky stuff is just in my free time. Um, I, in my real life, I'm a stage director and I run an opera company that I set up in 2019. And I freelance as well as a director and as a singer. And um, in fact, Shameless plug, we have a show coming up this weekend in Boston. So if anyone happens to be watching your stream who's in Boston, not Boston, Lincolnshire, but Boston in the United <laughs> States, um, we have a show tomorrow night and Saturday night. So it's been very busy in the last couple of weeks. But um, my company is doing a, a piece by Benjamin Britten, a sort of a person who ages pretty closely with Tolkien. Um, the the their years of life pretty neatly overlap. And I was asking another Tolkien friend the other day, you know if Tolkien was a fan of Britain's music? No idea. But Humphrey Carpenter did write biographies about Britain and Tolkien. So there's a tenuous link there. Um, but yeah, so we're doing Britain's uh, church parable, The Prodigal Son, this weekend. And it is also going to stream. So from the end of October, through the end of the first week of November, uh, Enigma Chamber Opera's Britain, two different Britain productions will be available online. And if anyone is interested in the music of Benjamin Britain or in Chamber Opera, please just check out enigmachamberopera.org. Excellent. There is a link down in the description to that as well. Um, let's go back to Middle Earth, though, and uh, let's yes. have a look. 
I mean, is there anything else about the dwarves and the elves and that whole plot that you think we, we should cover off before we sort of um, get elsewhere? I just wanted to acknowledge something that I saw in the chat as it was flashing by that when I was saying I wish it had been a bit more shades of grey about Duran Senior and Duran Junior's for argument. And uh, Joe commented they used up all their grey on Adar and Sauron, which I thought was very funny. So I just wanted <laughs> to share that comment. Um no, I don't think so. I, I, you know, I just I look forward to seeing how it plays out more. I do like the Elrond Durin relationship. Um, you know, again, I thought it, it, against my will, in a way, in the last episode, I thought some of the stuff was a bit cheesy the way it was written, some of the scripting was a bit clunky with um Durin being like Elrond, you know, and yet. <laughs> It was so well played that I did find myself moved to tears at one point. And I was like, in spite of me sitting here with one half of my brain going, this is not terribly well written. The other half of me was very moved by the actors' performances. So I know I keep saying that as is becoming apparent. I have plenty of issues with plot points. I have no issue with the skill of the people they hired to play these characters. Yeah, I think I would echo that completely. For me, this is the heartbeat of the story. I was expecting it to be the Harfoots, but for me, this is actually the 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 home life of Durin and Disa, and the addition of the friendship with Elrond has really been the heartbeat of this. This is when you think of Tolkien, what does it feel like? This is um, the, the friendship that is there, the loyalty, the love that's what we've got on show here so um i think we can easily go down into critiquing things but um i do have to give credit where credit is due here kazadoom looked amazing it's my my favorite visual of the whole show um and that um feel the family feel the friendship feel i think was excellent so um i don't want to critique it too much i did i didn't like uh, some of the elements of what they did with the dwarves i didn't like the rock smashing contest i didn't like the fact that they created a tension begin at the beginning with uh, um locking out elrond and things that felt very forced to me but once we got into it i thought it was wonderful so um well done more of that please i, I would like that uh, <laughs> quite a lot um but as i say I want the plot to develop. I, I don't want. I don't just want the dwarves to be sitting there. Yes, obviously they do just sit there, but I want something to happen that actually gives them a bit of development, rather than just um, uh, we're sitting here and being a bit grumpy about the elves. Um, uh, welcome to uh, the members' club, Funny T. Christensen. Uh, great to have you on board. Let's. Let's have a look. Uh, let's, should we move over to the Southlands now, um, uh, Mordor, as is? Um, what's what's your take on this? Because I think what I found, I mean, uh, the first half of the the plot for me, this is a it, in two halves. I think we, we could probably look at it that way. The first half, when this was uh, Bronwyn and Arondir and what are the Uzorks doing underground and uh, his Adar, very mysterious, uh, or what's with that spooky sword, that I personally really liked. I thought that was, that was I was not expecting to engage with that so much, but uh, when I was trying to unpack what is it that was appealing to me about it, it was that the thought actually... Yeah, there, there was, there is a story here somewhere that Tolkien didn't write about about where, how did, uh, how did this become Sauron's base? Because for the first thousand years or so of the Second Age, it wasn't Sauron's base, and then it became Sauron's base. Um, so what happened there? And I thought actually that's as a good a way as way as, as any to introduce that and to mm -hmm. to show the people who were there. Um, being pushed aside by the orcs and mm -hmm. also the way that the elves viewed those humans as being you know you, you you're you're bound to fall under sauron's spell um because it was only a thousand years ago um that that worked really well for me so i really enjoyed that first half um we'll get on to sort of the mount doom stuff in just one moment but what what was your take on that as a as a setup yeah i liked it it's funny i didn't have that many strong feelings about that 
you know, I was more, I suppose partly because these were kind of all created characters. So I felt more emotionally invested in what were they going to do with the dwarves? What were they going to do with the elves? And the Southlands, I was kind of like, yeah, all right, whatever. Um, I thought, again, you know, great performances. I love Arondir. I think Ismail Cruz Cordova does a fantastic job um, with his intensely extraordinary eyes. Um, I, you know, I think they were hoping that, that to set him up as the sort of Legolas heartthrob of the elves for this show. And I think he's done a pretty great job of that. Um, I just, I, and I didn't mind the plot points. I was intrigued by where that sword hilt might have come from. I liked that it seemed like it hadn't actually belonged to Theo's family. Now, I don't know whether we're going to find that it did. I don't know if we're going to find out more about his dad, this whole thing about who is his dad, where has he gone? But I, I thought it was going to be sort of clearly an heirloom of his family. But then it seemed like the barn that he went and fished it out under the floorboard actually belonged to that character who was called something that sounded like Baldrick. I kept thinking it was Baldrick. <laughs> Baldrick. Blackadder. But I think it was Bowrig or something. Um, Baldrick. Okay, the uh, have you heard of him, lad? Chap. Yeah. Um, who did a great job, by the way. I loved that character. I thought, yeah, I thought he did. Uh, it was exactly the, the right level of being really anxious and slimy without going too far. Yes, absolutely. I've, that is the one line from the show that I have quoted frequently to people. It's my best. Have you heard of him? Anyway, um, it was his barn that that was hidden in. And obviously we get the sense that he is a, a Sauron loyalist. It was almost like the dark mark in Harry Potter that he was going to reveal on his forearm that he was, you know, a, a loyalist to he who shall not be named. But um, so I thought that was kind of interesting because I liked the idea that, it, that, that Theo just found it because he was looking for contraband or whatever. Um, and that there is some other lineage there so I was kind of cool with all of that I found Theo a bit annoying but I sort of tend to find kids in these shows a bit annoying so that probably says more about me than it says about him um but yeah again I just largely didn't I, I had some issues you said we'll come on to the Mount Doom I had some issues with that but largely I was sort of just fine with that bit of the plot I was like all right let's see how this plays out I don't really feel particularly strongly one way or the other about it yeah, uh, some interesting comments in the chat. Andrew K saying, Aaron Deer seemed the most essentially elvish portrayal in his demeanour and disposition, yes, even totally. more than the established characters. Me, I would agree with that. Yeah, completely. I think that uh, a really good job there. Uh, Nicole Desnoy is saying, I'm interested to see what happens with Theo and Aaron Deer. I hate to admit it, uh, though, but I just couldn't connect with Bronwyn at all. Um, yeah, I mean, I can, I can understand that. I'm fascinated by Theo. Um, I'm convinced he's he's going to go down a dark path. If he's not going to be uh, a Nazgul, then I'm, I will be shocked. Um, his uh, his I miss the feeling of power is just so um, uh, right. so obvious a setup for for somebody saying you want power, this ring will give you power. Um, so that that works really well. Um, and I think the other th the other thing that I mean, this is just a very small real life issue is that you say you find kids um, annoying. Um, he will not be a kid for the rest of this show. Uh, he, this is true. He's already uh, the, the filming was now what two years ago uh, for when that was. He's already we, we both were lucky enough to be at the, the, the premiere and could see him and he's shot up um, as an actor. He's now uh, he does not look like a kid anymore. So. Right. Um, in later seasons, I mean, probably he'll be in his early 20s by the time they finish filming I, um, this. I love that one of your mods just wrote the one ring.net hates children. <laughs> <laughs> Please yes, remember, uh, I, I am not the voice of the one ring.net. There are many, many of us at the one ring.net, and I'm only. And they all hate them. children. Yeah, this is. Uh... <laughs> A well, well known fact. Um, but let's so Aaron Deer, I think, generally speaking, I, I was a part expecting not to like him because I I didn't hugely love the Legolas, Legolas character that always felt a little bit forced. It is like, what cool thing can we do with Legolas now? And if they were going to try and do that with this character, uh, but I think he did, he came across well. I think that they handled the love story well, as in not overdoing it, just a little bit here and there. Um, uh, I say I, I really like Waldrig. I thought he's great. I hope he comes back 
as being this sort of really annoying lieutenant, just sort of like saying, uh, are you Sauron? Um, uh, so <laughs> I'm still looking for Sauron. Yeah. Uh, so I, I hope, I hope he, he sticks around. But let's talk about Adar, uh, because I... I loved Adar. I thought out of all of the new characters, he was the one that worked best for me. Um, I think they used him as a vehicle to have some really interesting meta discussions about the nature of orcs, the kind of thing that um, Tolkien himself changed his mind about the nature of orcs quite a lot. And they used this as an opportunity to show Galadriel's view on orcs and his view on orcs and that was basically talking talking to himself about that which was probably the best bit of writing I saw on the show um yeah. but as a character as well I th I think that Joseph Moll did an amazing job um I think just to deliver a character who you know is evil but at the same time you actually quite like uh, and you kind of respect is is quite a, a great uh, task and, and he, he pulled it off brilliantly um, but what's your take? I mean I assume you also liked Adar, do you think we're going to get more of him and if so what's he going to be doing? Oh for sure we must get more of him and I actually really hoped in the end as the season unfolded that he was going to turn out to be Sauron and um, that when he said that he killed Sauron, that he was sort of talking metaphorically, that he was reinventing himself after the end of the first age. And a lot of what he said about wanting to sort of care for the orcs and everything was very similar to some of the things that um, Tolkien said, for example, Milton Waldman, I remembered what his last name was. Then he was <laughs> writing to Milton Waldman and he talked about how when Sauron repented after the end of the first age after Morgoth was gone and his desire to, as he saw it, heal Middle Earth, um, that he did have these, what he felt were good intentions. And that's always very interesting to me. Most villainous characters do not think that they are the villain, you know, with the possible exception of somebody like Iago in Othello, who pretty clearly goes, I'm a bad guy. Uh, most people think what they're doing is the right thing to be doing, you know? And I think it would have been so interesting if he actually had, I was really hoping it was gonna turn out that he was Sauron all along and that we were then gonna see him be Anatar in season two, because it was such a strong, interesting character. And as you said, Robert, really well-written stuff. Talk about Shades of Grey. Um, just that sort of dichotomy of that he seemed to be the out and out bad guy but then he has this compassion for his orcs um and then galadriel in seems to be the villain in the conversation with him she's the mm -hmm. genocidal maniac and he's the one showing compassion and i thought that was sort of shocking um and and discomforting but therefore good writing um joseph moore did you see ripper street that was a great show and no. he he was in that he was a baddie in that as well he obviously <laughs> gets cast as as villains but he was very good in ripper street as well and um yeah i i just thought he was very cool i wish they had let him say mordor instead of doing the sort of tacky yeah text at the top of the screen reveal of mordor um but yeah, I, I, we surely he has to feature. There, there must be some relevance to him. But what will they do with him if Halbrand slash Anatar slash Sauron comes back as he seemed to be doing at the end of season one to claim Mordor for himself? What will become of Adar? Will he accept him? Will there be a conflict between them? I, I don't know. I can't. I can't predict where they're going with that, but you surely can't waste one of the strongest written characters that you've got in your show by not, not having them in the next season. No, and I think this is a, the fascinating thing, where we're going next with this, because Sauron has to get control this next season of Mordor. And he has to start building Baradur, and he has to create a forge in Mount Doom. Um, if you're going to fit the whole story into five seasons, that has to happen, really, in season two. And the 
at the moment, it seems like the situation is that he got kicked out and killed by Adar, and the orcs all hate him. So he will have to come in really badass on them and just take control in some way. I, th I think the only way to do it, surely, is to defeat Adar in some way. He has to show Adar that you know he's the boss, whether mm. that means killing him or, or enslaving him in some way. I I don't know. Um, and it's but true. I hope they show us. The orcs do have to hate him. This is true, and it's funny because we were talking about this at New York Comic Con on a panel where um, New Better Do New Better Do Better was with us on mm. the panel, and he's terrific. Um, and we were sort of debating about who was going to turn out to be Sauron because this was before the finale. And I was saying, please, please let it be Adar. And he was like, but the orcs have to end up hating him. And I was like, but we've got centuries to go. And he was mm. so well written with all these shades of grey. I thought I could see him himself becoming a, a sort of overlord that the very children he was seeking to protect ended up hating him. So I, I could have seen that happening. But... Um, a much simpler way and therefore slightly less interesting in my opinion is just to have Sauron come and kill Adar and so then the orcs hate him. Yeah. I I think that's the most likely thing. I don't want it to happen, as I say, just because I like the character. Uh, but let's talk about Mount Doom um, and that whole, um, what was it, episode six? That whole um, episode... Um, we, I mean, we, we, I, we, everybody said a lot about this, but where do you come down on that? Is that how you imagine Mount Doom being created? Did you like how they did it? Um, what about the fallout? Literally, did that work for you? What's What's your take there? I didn't hate it. I I know <laughs> a lot of people were the low bar, <laughs> damning with faint praise. Yeah. Um, now, I know a lot of people were quite up in arms about it. I mean, I felt that it was, I was sort of, I could buy it, that whole idea of if you do have a sudden influx of water into, uh, you know, a lava bed, it's going to create steam and it's going to erupt. So I was like, all right, I can buy that. Um, I didn't really like the way the sword hilt was a key. That was not very interesting to me. It was a bit of a sort of MacGuffin moment and... It felt a bit Indiana Jones. Like, if it had been an Indiana Jones movie, I'd have been fine with it. That sort of X marks the spot, insert the sword here, and it will unlock stones which will move and the Temple of Doom will be created, um, or the Mountain of Doom in this case. Indiana Jones and the Mountain of Doom. Um, in that kind of show or film, I'd have been fine with it, a sort of, you know, adventure, action that, you know, X marks the spot treasure hunt. In Tolkien's realm, it seemed out of place to have this sort of weird, there is a sword hilt, which is actually a key and X marks the spot and puts put it in and it will, stones will move and water will be released. So I didn't like how the water was released. I was fine with the release of the water causing a volcanic eruption. Um, you know, you wonder why everyone in Pompeii perished when everyone in Middle Earth seemed to get off pretty well okay from the volcanic eruption. Yeah. Uh, so, but I mean, again, it's uh, there are a lot of things that I might sort of go, eh, but it doesn't needle at me. I can, I can just say, okay, fine. Yes, it's a little strange that everybody more or less survived, but okay, fine. Um, it's. I thought it was quite, in the big picture, I thought it was quite cool that the Southlands, as you said before, had to become Mordor in some way. And I quite liked the idea that it had always been this plan that if we could just get that dormant volcano to erupt, we could blot out the sun and make this a haven for orcs. Quite a cool idea. I, I was all right with that. Yeah, Andrew Kay saying, uh, my issue with the Mount Doom activation was that a master manipulator like Sauron would not leave such things to chance in the way that uh, the Rings of Power did. Yes. Um, I think there's a, a, a bit more, whether they will actually ever do this, I don't know now. It may well be that we've got Mordor deal with it. Um, but it did feel like there's another 
layer there that perhaps they need to explain a little bit more is that we have uh, so are we, we're given to understand that this was Sam's plan to get everybody there and he'd got this sword which had got his sigil thing on it so this seems to have been his sword and therefore presumably his plan which presumably he shared with Adar but in order for it to work you needed to actually do all those tools uh, so was it that Sauron had this plan originally and then Adar came in and just took over the plan and so actually he fulfilled it is that what we're given to that's understand? why I wanted Adar to turn out to be Sauron I wanted that to be his bluff that he was carrying out the plan because it was his plan and when it when he didn't turn out to be Sauron I was like well if he hates Sauron that much why I mean I get that he'd be like yeah but it'll be better off for my orcs if we can create a cloud cover mm. so so I'll go along with the plan anyway. But it seemed a little strange that he would be so vehemently anti-Sauron and still carry out the plan that he knew to be Sauron's. So that was a little weird. And and as you just, the, whoever you just mentioned in the chat, that, that chance thing is the thing that makes it feel like a treasure map adventure, X marks the spot type thing, rather than a thought out plan from a great mastermind of villainy. Yes. And I mean, again, it's a small thing. I, I have to admit that the I, I was a little disappointed that the sword that I thought was a great idea when it came up. I was so intrigued by the sword. So it's like a magic sword. It's clearly evil. Look, it's dark. It's twisty. It drinks blood. It's got Sauron's mark on it. There's the smoke and it kind of it will appear and then disappear. And um, you sort of hear faint chanting in the black speech in the background. It's there's something big and important going on. And actually, it literally was just a clunk and click kind of mechanism, um, which did make you think, well, why do you need to have that? If you do you not to think do we'll see the sword again then? Do you think the sword is gone? I, I think it's served its purpose now, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, you're probably would... right. But I was hoping against hope because of everything you were saying, it was obviously a Morgul blade. It was cool to see a Morgul blade reform in the same way that we saw it disintegrate in PJ's movies. And I thought at some point it would become a sword that would be wielded by the witch king or somebody else so i was hoping that that hilt might might come back in in a future episode but and maybe it couldn't possibly have to because it's been blown to bits i don't know yeah it's yeah, it's, it's just odd is that the, the, there's there's a, a, a couple of pieces of information we don't have that maybe they're going to tell us or maybe it's just going to be left to uh, we'll just see that this Sauron's plan that Adar took over. Um, uh, in the chat, someone was saying, oh, me no other saying it was Adar's plan. Um, he tasked that man to use the sword. Yeah, it was definitely, he. at the very least, he took over the plan um, yeah. and uh, was hunting for Sauron's sword because it, it clearly was Sauron's originally because the sword was being held for Sauron. Um, and uh, that's what Waldreg was basically doing. He was saying, Sauron's coming. We're hold it. This is this is Sauron. Here's his little mark. That was Sauron's sword. And then Adol was trying to find it. So that was seems to be what was going on there. Um, but let's talk about uh, the good guys in, in Mordor, or the good guy left in Mordor, which is Isildur. Morally saying Isildur is still in the lands of Mordor somewhere. His horse Beric has gone trotting off to find him. Where do you think he'll be? And what will he be doing? Will he end up a prisoner of Adar or even Sauron? What you see happening with his character in season two. Yeah, so this is, um, uh, spoiler alert, but, you know, Isildur's going to survive. Um, he he has got a future in this story, so they might have left him for dead, but he is not dead. So this is intriguing because this is not, this is new storyline. We don't get much about Isildur in uh, in the books until uh, sort of later on in uh, in Numenor, and we'll come on to Numenor in just a moment. But he, he is there, stranded uh, in uh, Mordor. Clearly, they're going to make a story there that I think will link back all the way through to the very end. I think this is going to be trying to create some sort of arc for him because he ends his story there. Um, 
basically at Mordor facing Sauron. So I think maybe he's going to start it and see the creation of, of the, the forge. I don't know, uh, something along those lines, uh, but he will, he will escape and he will make his way back. I, I think probably by the end of the season, he will make his way back to Numenor. But what's your, do you think he'll get taken prisoner? Do you think they'll find him? Do you think he'll be doing some undercover mission there? Or do you think he'll just try and get out as quick as he can? I don't know. It's an interesting idea. I hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me that he would stay in Mordor for any length of time. And, and your patron's question there, I'm like, oh, that's an interesting idea because I just assumed that his horse was going to find him and bring him back and that it would be an Aragorn coming back to Helm's Deep moment. Um, and, um, you know, Aragorn comes back on Brago, Isildur comes back on Beric, and he is recovered to his homeland. Um, and I... I, that was my feeling, that he's, his horse is going to find him, rescue him, bring him back, he's going to be back in Numenor. I do like the idea that he might stay in Mordor and be an undercover agent <laughs> and, and uh, find out more about what's going on, and it gives him a personal reason to particularly want to cut the ring from Sauron's hand. Um, so, yeah, that would be kind of cool. Maybe they are going to do something like that. I don't know. My, if I had to put money on it, I think he's going to be back in Numenor pretty quickly. But it would be cool if he wasn't. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably fair. Just in terms of storytelling, if, we are, if we've got Sauron there, the only other characters we've got are Adar and Isildur, because everyone else has left and gone. So um, if you're wishing to tell a story in Mordor next season, then having that third character there gives you a whole load of extra options. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, oh, I just spotted we got 6,500. Uh, thank you so much, uh, dollars we've raised so far. Um, uh, we just hit that a little while ago. So thank you, everyone. Um, I hugely appreciate it if you have donated uh, today. Um, um, thank you so much for being generous. Uh, let's keep going. Let's see how, how much more we can get on the rest of this stream. Uh, but let's talk about Numenor. Um, I haven't got any specific questions from my patrons on this, but what's your take overall on Numenor as a place? This is the first time we've seen Numenor on screen anywhere. Did you like what you saw? I did. I thought it was beautiful. Um, I really enjoyed seeing the sort of architecture and um, I loved when they went into the chamber where the Palantir was and, and you had you know, Narsil on the wall and um, Tours, you know, Dramborleg and all of this as well. That, that was one of the best Easter egg moments of the whole season, I think, that you could spot that and be like, mm. it's that. So that was cool. Um, again, at the risk of being a broken record, great acting. I think um, Lloyd Owen is fab as Elendil. Um I'm not sure about some of the plotting in Numenor is a bit baffling to me at the moment. Uh, who is Kemen? What is the point of him? Um, who is Aerian? I mean, I know she's Elendil's daughter, but what is the point of her? Um, they both were bizarrely sort of anti the soldiers, both of them, including Elendil's daughter, seemed really anti any of the Numenorians going to Middle Earth. And so I was like, ooh, what if they turn out to be, you know, what if Kemen is actually, wouldn't that be fun, Sauron in disguise or something like that? I mean, I didn't think that was actually going to happen. But I was like, oh, wow, there could be something quite cool here. And then just nothing. Now I know it's only season one, but I didn't really get the point of that of those characters. I think Tristan Gravel is brilliant as far as on. I'm not sure what that character is going to do. Presumably he's going to become our Farazon at some point, um, probably quite soon. And Muriel losing her sight is a good excuse for him to say, oh, well, I better take over for you. But I, I also think she may only be temporarily blind. I think it may be one of those kind of injuries where with rest, and time your sight comes back. I, I, I don't think she's going to stay blind as a character. Um, some of the bits of script writing that I really didn't like, 
were in Numenor. I'm not talking about plot, just individual lines that were anachronistic. So mm. things like when Farazon said, drinks all round, you know, we, we had in Peter Jackson's movie, Boromir saying, break out the ale, these men are thirsty, that, fine. Drinks all round, feels very modern. And the worst line was Aerian saying to her brother, when he said, what are you doing here? And she said, I had a dinner like mm. she'd been on a date. And so there were some really clunky bits of script writing in, in Numenor that just did not feel Tolkien-esque at all. But architecturally beautiful costumes, beautiful, great acting, some strange characters that I'm not sure what they're doing there. So I need to see more. Well, I mean, in terms of the strange actors, not sure what they're doing there, I think one of the things which I, I find fun is as we we saw with Theo is who who's going to be an Nazgul? <laughs> um, who are, who are the nine uh, going to be? And um, Tolkien said three of the nine men who got the rings of power and became Nazgul, they were in Numenor. So some of the characters who are there are definitely going to turn out to be uh, Nazgul, and it's not any of the named ones that we know. So it, there had to be new characters that they've introduced. So I think at least one of, of Kem, Kemen and Erendil will be going down that dark path to, to being a, a ring wraith. Um, I, I think for me, my, I, I did enjoy looking at Numenor. I thought it was fantastic. Some mm. kind of the swoopy uh, things going in, seeing the, 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 the ships and, the, as you say, the architecture, um, the... It, that looked exactly how I wanted Newman or to look, pretty much. Um, I did think the biggest concern for me was the uh, the scale, and not in terms of just like the numbers of people who were there or the buildings, but just this did not feel like the most advanced, huge, thriving, bustling civilization. It felt that there were two, maybe three families, um, and then a f whole load of other people there. We the the politicky stuff was just two people talking um which didn't really work for me um mm. so it just i i want it to be more complex i want it to be more nuanced not just the elves coming over here stealing our jobs and women that is just a little bit too basic for me um yeah. i want this to be more elevated i want this to be more complex i want there to be um layers to what's going on so and this, this has been a deliberate decision because they could have had uh, in in the books elendil isn't just a ship captain who was from mm -hmm. some famous fa family ages ago um his dad was on the king's council he was very well known uh, as a person and they they've taken that out therefore they've stripped down who is in this center of, of power um and i think that's not worked for me yet so what i want to see particularly as later on, that's going to be quite important. Who actually has the control and power in uh, in Numenor? I would like there to be a slightly bigger and more complex network of of people and organisations yeah. and things going on there. Yeah, one of the one of the people in your in your chat, I just noticed. I think it was Stefan saying that the worst line of script was Muriel saying "I see" and Elendil saying to it, "Can you?" And uh, I agree with that wholeheartedly, talking about bad lines of text. I actually laughed out loud at that point, and I gave that feedback to Amazon. I wrote to them and I was like, who was it that thought it was a good idea to have her say the line, I see, at the moment that she realised she couldn't see? Mm, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, there were, I, I think I would agree, yeah, but the, the, the lines, some of the lines did, I did wonder whether they were intended as humour, and I think... <laughs> they weren't um so uh that's probably not <laughs> the best sign um a couple of uh, questions actually in in the chat nicole these are interesting ones uh, nicole uh Desnoy is saying uh two questions about numenor what do we think um that erendil uh saw in oh sorry arian saw in the palantir um which is a good one so this was a it was a, a slightly weird cliffhanger to leave us on um the uh, episode eight obviously she gets this kind of deathbed um 
mistaken identity thing, which um, was quite amusing, happening exactly the same week, uh, week as a deathbed mistaken identity by the king thing happening over in House of the Dragon. Um, but it happens here, and then it's like, go, there's there's the Palantir, and, and she's up there, and she yeah, discovers it. Um, I, I initially thought she's going to see the Doom of Numenor, and then that made me wonder what it is that she would react to. I now wonder whether she even needs to look at it because I think the point here is that this is elven technology. This, this is an elf thing. And the King here has, um, uh, has clearly been using it. And from what he's been saying, his daughter has been using this as well. And she's been hiding this from us. This is a way to be communicating with elves. And that I think might be a, a, a way into the, the clue, which is where we're heading towards. Um, but th did you, d where do you think they're going with that? Because it is, as I say, it felt a little bit odd, just like a, oh, something completely unexpected and a character discovering a thing that uh, otherwise they might not, and we don't know what they're going to do with it. What What do you think? Will she put her hand on it and see stuff? Um. I don't know. I like your thought of it being like a direct phone line with the elves. I think that's a little too clever, dare I say it, for the screenwriters to be. I don't <laughs> think that's going to be what they had in mind that um, Muriel and her father have been having contact with the elves. I also, to me, it's interesting about the Palantiri that... Um, my, again, my understanding of them, and this doesn't mean that it's the way that the showrunners and screenwriters would put it, is that um, you have to be of a certain strength of will and of a certain maybe even bloodline, like one of the Dunedain or whatever, to be able to bend the Palantir to your will and therefore to be able to see what you want to see, what you're looking for. Like if I want to see what's going on in this part of the world or, you know, with this particular Palantir... And so if Aerian did touch it, would she see anything? And if she did see anything, surely it could only be what someone else with a Palantir wanted to make her see. Um, my assumption, therefore, was that the reason that the fall of Numenor has been being seen in the Palantir is because some evil force, um, probably Sauron as our main evil force, is wanting Numenorians to see that, is wanting to put that image in their head to create fear, to create discord, um, possibly with the idea of turning them against the elves, breaking an alliance, whatever. So my feeling is that no one in Numenor who's using the Palantir, if they're using the Palantir, is seeing anything that's just an honest vision. They're seeing things that they're being made to see and therefore anything that appears in there is being used for negative influences and corruption. So it would seem weird to me if Elendil's daughter did see something in there, but if she doesn't, I would imagine it's just gonna be the fall of Numenor again, the same thing that Muriel's seen, the same thing that her father has seen, you know, um, and I think that is all just meant to be fueling this division between the faithful and the king's men. That the fear of the end of their island causes some of them to say it's the elves are the problem and we've got to shut our doors and that's how we'll survive. And that actually sort of hastens them towards their downfall. Yeah, I mean, they, they certainly presented it as if it's stuck. As, as, as a Palantir, it's now it's glitching and it only shows you this one yeah. thing. Um, I think the interesting thing for me is that this is um, canonically should be one of seven that there are on that island. Uh, there are other ones that, that they, so these then get taken out at the end. Uh, they get taken out by Lendil and Isildur, and these are the ones that get dotted about Middle Earth. That's where they come from. So there, there should be more than one of them out there. Um, the question is, who else might be using it? Mm. Um, and mm. I do wonder whether the sort of mysterious uh, Numenorians out in the West uh, that we keep on hearing about, the ones who are sticking by the, the, the old ways, maybe they've got one of them. Uh, so maybe they are wanting to make sure that the king can see 
the doom of Numenor because they can see it coming. Um, I mean, yes, it's an, it's an interesting thought that somebody might have put in there because the, the Palantir isn't just a, a magical myst mystic ball that you can see stuff randomly. There, you can link them up with others and control what other people can see. Yeah. Um, no, no, I'm just I'm sort of intrigued by who might have others, and and I'm thinking back now to what they might be doing in the east where we said earlier on why is the strangers slash wizard slash gandalf going to the east where do these worshippers of melkor come from these three characters and they were called like one of them's called the oh well, i can't remember now they have names in the credits mm. the something the something and the something those three sort of priestessy figures maybe they have a palantir over in the east and maybe they're trying to poison the watering hole, so to speak. I, you know, maybe that's going to be part of why he's heading to the east, what he's got to deal with. I mean, it's, good, it's as good an idea as any, I think. it's um, <laughs> Clearly, he has to be heading over there to do some good. And at the moment, it's still not attached to the rest of the plot. So um, if they are going to have this as a Gandalf character, I think they will keep it... Um, uh, quite low key in terms of what he actually does, uh, so mm -hmm. that it doesn't jar too much. Because at having Gandalf in his kind of third age glory going around, uh, he has to be involved and is mentioned in the story. But for him to, if he is there in the, th in the second age, I think he has to be doing stuff that most people don't know he's doing, almost like he's there yeah. on a secret mission. Uh, so, yeah, may maybe that's where he goes over and disrupt some plans but i think it works better for me that somebody is trying to warn the king of it um and say if you don't change your ways this is going to happen rather than so discontent by saying how you're all going to die um i think that's the way i would go with that but let's um uh, let's move over to um galadriel and halbrand which we've sort mm -hmm. of talked about a little <laughs> pardon me but uh, the, I mean, I don't. It's hard to sort of frame a question here, but did you like what? Because this was clearly was the, the central plot point of the whole yeah. series. It started out with uh, Galadriel she's hunting for Sauron, and it turns out actually her mate through the whole season is Sauron. Um, did you like what they did there? Because that was all completely new. Yeah, no, I didn't really. Um, I was very disappointed that Halbrand turned out to be Sauron. And I know that you and I had had a conversation via WhatsApp where you were telling me what all the clues were that he was Sauron. And I was like, yeah, but no, let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> I really hoped he wasn't going to be because, again, for me, uh, it had the potential to be much more interesting if he really was a guy who was trying to be a good guy and if he could have continued on being a warrior and a strong character and then later had become one of the nine one of the ring race maybe even the witch king to me that's so interesting if galadriel had really forged a friendship with this guy who yes shows his propensity for violence we'd seen that and, um, you know, we know the hearts of men are easily corrupted and all of that. And if he is really a king in the South, I was like, well, OK, because we know that some of the ring race were kings of men. So fair enough. And, and that to me was kind of exciting. I liked the idea that that it would be somewhere further down the line when they really had forged an, an alliance, the two of them, a camaraderie, that it would then be heartbreaking for her to see him fall under the spell of one of the rings of men and fade away and become a wraith. How cool would that be? But instead for it just to be like, oh, actually he was the big bad all along. Um, that was disappointing. I didn't believe it. I didn't buy it because he seemed too... To, like, why would he say things like, I don't want to go back to Middle Earth? I mean, I suppose they're saying because he was lying all along, but it just didn't gel for me. The way that he was behaving didn't seem consistent with either a genuinely repentant Anatar, which according to different times, that different bits of writing from Tolkien, either his repentance was entirely fake or at one point he genuinely was repentant, but then 
made his way back to the path of evil. It, he didn't seem to be either a genuinely repentant, but then shifting back or fake repentant. It just, I don't know, it didn't work for me. I didn't like that their relationship almost seemed a little bit romantic. At one point, there was a little bit of sort of gazing into each other's eyes and being like, yes, I feel it too, which maybe the script writers didn't mean, but I would love to see stronger writing of a male and a female character developing a really good friendship without the when Harry met Sally premise that you can't be friends without it becoming romance. Um, and then he just sort of suddenly became, ah, 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 I've been the big bad all along. Um, so it was disappointing to me. I, I could see it heading that way, but I kept thinking, no, please don't do that. Please go for the more interesting option of having him become a wraith in like season three or something. So I was disappointed. Um, I don't, uh, Galadriel's got a long way to go to become the wise Galadriel that we know. And I don't mind her taking longer than one season to get there. That's fine. Um, I did think it was quite cool that Will Fletcher who played Finrod in a way got to play Sauron in because there he was mm. pretending to be her brother. And that was kind of fun because I, I do think Will Fletcher is a superb actor. And even though Finrod has only been on screen for the tiniest moment, I thought he just nailed that role. So it was very fun to see him back and have him being a bit villainous as well as being her brother. That was cool. But overall, that did disappoint me. I, I'm not a fan of Halbrand being Sauron. Well... Just to clear up one thing, Charlie Vickers um, has uh, gone up in my estimation. I don't know. I, I, he gained quite a bit of respect for me. Um, I, I've, I've retweeted a couple of things that he said recently in interviews where he's been, obviously he's not been allowed to talk about any of this stuff to anyone. So I think he's just like saying, now I can tell you about it. And he, he, he's been very clear. He did not see that as a romantic relationship. And um, uh, he he's clearly was grappling with how to, unpack this character he'd been given his directions he's been reading the books and and therefore what does this mean what is he actually trying to do here with galadriel and and he was very clear this wasn't him saying you can be my queen and and will be like man and wife or something like that that wasn't what he was thinking it was like a partner um mm -hmm. uh, but uh we can sort of do this together and i'll bring my strength and you bring your strengths um but perhaps he didn't, it wouldn't end up like that because he's not that kind of guy to share power. So uh, I would, I would recommend you do check out the, the, what he has said, because I I found that quite reassuring. Um, I, I, I agree with, I mean, I was I've, a very early convert to the idea of, the, of, of Hellbrand being Sauron. I, I think that they, they pushed, uh, so many buttons very early on that made me go well if this guy isn't then you're going to have to come up with some other master manipulator um expert smith who's about to become the king of mordor um so it just it just felt too clear to me that that's what it was um i do want a little bit more clarity about as you say the, the repentance thing because um we've just had that whatever it was like five minutes of him talking to Galadriel to help us try and understand exactly what it was that was going on there. But it, the, the implication seems to be that he was truly penitent all this time. And uh, he was actually happy to be a smith on Numenor. And it was Galadriel who gave him hope that he could gain forgiveness and, uh, and brought him back into the game. That was certainly what he was saying to her. Whether he meant that, we do not know. But that seems to be what they're trying to tell us. Um, but if, if that's the case, then a lot of the things that I thought of being evidence for, for Sauron or Hellbrand being Sauron are actually not the case because there's not so much intentionality there. I, right. I had thought that he must, it, it's too much of a coincidence for him to be randomly meeting Gladriel in the middle of the sea. I thought he must have manipulated that to make that happen. It must, it was too much of a coincidence for uh, for him to say, I have other plans, uh, and then suddenly out of literally blue skies, uh, a storm to appear to stop their conversation and blow them over to uh, Elendil's path. I thought that was just, that had to be more than just coincidence. Um, but the implication I think now is that this is just 
coincidence. This is just uh, what happens to be the case. Um, well, that's that's the thing. That's why I have the issue with that. It seemed to be sort of straddling two camps. That it's like, well, mm. either he really has repented, uh, but then something happens to turn him back to the dark side, as it were. But what was it? We didn't really see anything that would be a significant trigger to turn him back to being evil. Or he was always manipulating things, in which case some of the stuff along the way just doesn't ring true. And that was the issue for me with it was like, I just, it's not, I like a reveal like that to be cleverly and cunningly crafted so that then I go, ah, yes, that is satisfying. And I didn't feel that way with this. Yeah, I, I think... And more needs to be unpacked there uh, for me to actually understand exactly what's going on. And I think probably we will get it because Adar is there and we, they still haven't unpacked the whole I killed him thing and uh, where where he did get the, the sigil in the pouch. What's in the pouch? That that Clearly there has to be something in the pouch. Um, I hope it's the raw ingredients for making a ring of power myself. I, that, that, that would be great. Um, but uh, yeah, there's there's still a lot of the backstory that we haven't been told yet. Um, Martin Sjöstrand saying, Hi, I wish Halbrand had not turned out to be Sauron. I know most things um, uh, about him pointed in that direction, but that is more or less my point. I felt it was too obvious, the sort of mystery narrative that they were going for, which I found quite an interesting uh, take because I think I found going through this that half the people thought that this was too obvious and half the people thought it wasn't obvious enough and the showrunners seemed to think that they would be okay if some people figured it out um but they clearly were trying to uh, get more casual viewers who aren't perhaps steeped in the law uh thinking that it might be the stranger or, or adult or something like that so um yeah it it, it was it, it seemed like that this was where they were going from quite early on to me but at the same time I always have to remember that I know a lot. I mean, I'm nerdier about this than most human beings. And so I will have picked up on a whole load of things that perhaps other people won't have picked up on. Um, yeah, but where I disagree with you on that is that I think, oh, sorry, I just dropped. Not okay. so um, I think those signs were all there, but it would have been cooler if they had been bluffs. Like I didn't, I saw those indicators and did not want them to be pointing in that direction. Um, I just think it would have been cleverer if they had been, as your your uh, commenter that you just mentioned, it sort of seemed too obvious if you know the law. And it would have been more interesting if it had been, ha-ha, that was a red herring um, mm. to me. Yes, I, I mean, I get it. Um, I don't... I mean, maybe this is the time for me to sort of talk about the mystery box thing. I don't like the fact that this was done as a mystery box, as a uh, a mystery. I think that this was, a, for me, the biggest misstep in the entire creation of the show was this taking it away from the way that Tolkien told a story, which was very clearly uh, early on, chapter one or two, here's the setup, this is what the stakes are, you're going to go on an adventure, go. And then we're carried along by the world, the characters the storyline um and there's never yes there might be a few mysteries along the way but it, we're not being misled mm -hmm. in any way that um anatar we know in the silmarillion we know anatar is sauron in the same sentence that anatar is introduced it's it's that straightforward so turning this into a a structure where this is all about the mystery the mystery is what is driving the action i think that it, it just for me, basically, it did not feel like the way that Tolkien told stories. Um, the the kind of aha, we've here's a big reveal at the end. Um, uh, you'll never guess what we've done. Um, that's not his style, and I I don't think. I mean, I always hesitate to uh, to sort of say Tolkien wouldn't have liked this, but it's um, he he didn't really like that kind of modern thriller. If you mm. ever read his sort of writings, the idea that of the twists and turns um, he thinks are good for once, but not for right. uh, rereads and things like that. So um, I, I didn't particularly like that. And the, the biggest problem I had flowing from that was that this meant that there was a lack of opposition in this story. There was therefore a, there was a lack of tension because we didn't have a baddie. 
Um, yeah. And therefore, you had to create some tension in this story all the way around. And, and how are you going to do that? By creating it where it wasn't there in the source material. So yeah. if Galadriel, to pull one random example, if Galadriel is there hunting down Sauron, somebody has to be opposing her. And she has she's not finding Sauron until the very end, but somebody has to oppose her. Who's the only person with any kind of authority that she would have to listen to? It's Gilgalad. And immediately you then have to make Gilgalad the person who is telling her to stop, mm -hmm. um, which shifts his character, and then you're actually starting to change the story around. Um, and how do you create some kind of uh, tension and dynamic in what's going on with the dwarves and the elves? Well, it wasn't there. We know it wasn't there. They were all getting along happily at this moment in time. And Anatar came in. But if we don't have a big baddie, then what do you do? You have to create tensions between the dwarves and elves, which were not there already. So, and this happens all across the plot, is that there's a lack of tension. So they've had to create it where it wasn't there already. I think that I would have been okay with one mystery. I totally agree with your point about it not being very Tolkien-esque. But the problem was the, the, the show was just littered with mysteries. Every thread had its own little, you know, what's in the box for the dwarves? And um, who is the stranger? Who is Adar? Mm. Why does Theo have this hilt? Why, you know, just the whole thing, their whole... MO seem to be we engage our audience by keeping them wondering and mystified. And I, I think one big mystery, I would have been okay with who is Sauron being the one big mystery if, yeah. if necessary, although I do take your point about then who is the, how do you have the antagonism? Um, but I think it was too much. And again, how much more interesting might it have been if we had known that Halbrand was Sauron, but Galadriel didn't know. Then there are some very interesting things you can do that become different kinds of cliffhangers for your audience because we're going, no, don't trust him. And, and then we get more engaged in that way. It's, I actually think the everything being a hook of cliffhanger, you don't know the answer, is actually in the end an alienating distancing effect in their writing rather than pulling us in. I think they wanted to hook us with all these mysteries, but I think it actually keeps us out a bit more. If if we had known the answers to some of the mysteries that the characters didn't know the answers to, mm. then that could have made for some very interesting writing and some interesting plotting. And I think they sort of missed a, a chance there. Yeah, I, I agree completely. It's, um, yeah, you you can actually cre create a lot more character development if you then have uh, the audience knowing what's going on. I mean, if scene one was Keller Brimbor and his forge, dark and stormy night, clang, 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 there's a knock on the door. Who is it? Uh, it's, it's someone who come here. He says, he says he wants to uh, share some gifts with you about some knowledge on smithing. Oh, well, bring him in. And everybody knows from the off, this is Sauron. Um, that doesn't actually get rid of the the any of the tension in fact it gives a chance for keller brimble to have a huge amount of uh development as he's un trying to figure out what's going on here and the other characters to react to that as well and the yeah. fact that we as the audience know does not diminish the the quality of the storytelling yeah, in my view totally. Um, but uh, I've got a few more uh, questions. I, I appreciate we've been going on for a couple of hours. So um, just let me know uh, when you uh, need to jump off. But we've got a, a couple more questions from my patrons. Um, Helen's little sister saying, um, uh, I'm forever grateful for your insight as I've not read any of the books, which is absolutely fine. Of course, I only know what's in the movies, um, uh, the show and your lectures. Uh, as lectures, but um, uh, I do I sometimes go on for a while. Um, you commented <laughs> on the Entwives. Um, who and what are they? And uh, where are those talking trees at this time of the story? And should they have been in the TV show? Well, um, uh, in terms of um, what they are, they are exactly what they sound like. They are, we have the Ents, who are the male trees, and the Entwives, who are the female trees. Um, and at this point in the story, 
whereas the Ents are sort of broadly stay where they are, the Ent wives sort of move around a bit. The Ent wives like gardening and culture, uh, uh, sort of ordering nature. The Ents tend to be a lot more let it go wild and free. Um, but they disappear. Obviously, we, we have uh, Treebeard, the incredibly sad, you know, um, where they, where have the end wives gone? They 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 they've gone away, and we don't know where they are. And it's it's this huge sense of loss which is there. They should be here at this point. Tolkien uh, speculated because this is the way that he, he used to do this kind of thing. He didn't just sort of say yes, this is what happened. Uh, he was like, well, I think what may have happened to the end wives is um, at some point in the second age, Sauron, uh, in retreating back towards Mordor, does a kind of a scorched earth approach, and probably gets rid of the Entwives then. I was hoping that perhaps this was where the Harfoots were going, uh, to um, uh, to where the Entwives were, and maybe the Entwives could teach them about cultivating uh, land, and that could lead them to them settling down. That would have worked really well for me, but um, we haven't will. seen them yet. Sorry? Maybe they will. Yeah, well, I hope so. I hope so. Um, but we haven't seen them yet, but they are around, and I hope we will. We saw them very briefly. Uh, when the the comet went across, a meteor man went flying through the sky. We did see uh, what looked like an, an ent wife there with an entling. Um, question from um, uh, Creative Branches saying, uh, hi everyone, this is Giacomo. Uh, welcome to my prediction list. So I'll quickly read this prediction list and perhaps you could use this as an opportunity, uh, Kirsten, just to tell me your predictions uh, for season two. Uh, sure. So predictions here are that the human and dwarf rings are forged and distributed off screen. The dwarves of khazad get greedy and close off from the rest of the world. The unfaithful of Numenor take power and banish the elf friends. Um, before they leave Numenor, Isildur steals a sapling from the white tree. The displaced Numenorians found Gondor. Um, a Sauron expands east clashes with the stranger. The stranger, a blue wizard, dies at the hands of Sauron, but effectively banishes Sauron from the rune. So those are a few um, uh, sort of quite fantastic ones. The idea that Sauron heading east and coming into contact with the stranger, I think, is a fantastic idea. Uh, so what's your, I mean, uh, hot takes on what we might see in season two? Well, I think we've we've sort of touched on some of it as we've talked, like we said about what we think Nori and the Stranger may or may not be going to the east for. Are they going to find a Palantir? I kind of like your what you just said now about maybe they're going to find the Entwives. That would be cool. I and mean, they are in green with the grapes, so it would be kind of awesome if they encountered some Ent families in season two. I would like that. Um, as I've mentioned already, I think Isildur's going to go back to Numenor pretty quickly. Um, I think we're. I think things are going to move more slowly than your your patron Giacomo's predictions. There, um, I think we will see one set of rings forged each season for the first few seasons. So we've just seen the three Elven rings. I think season two is going to be about the Dwarven rings, um, and and hopefully move the dwarf story forward somewhat. Maybe season three then is the rings that go to men. Season four, perhaps, is the forging of the One Ring. Season five is the power of Sauron leading us to the last alliance battle, maybe. Um, wow. So who knows? But I think they're going to spread those forgings out over the seasons. Um, we'll definitely, I think, all the main characters that we have been establishing so far. Uh, um, Sadak Burroughs was the one that to me was clearly expendable from the beginning and I was pretty sure <laughs> I just mostly because I thought oh I don't think so well, Lenny Henry's going to want to sign on for more than one season of this and the way that he had talked about it in interviews like he was interviewed in the Radio Times way before the show came out and it just the way he talked about it I was like oh yeah he's already done he's checked out of this show he knows his character ain't coming back um, but all the rest of the main characters that have been established, I don't see any of them dying in the near future. doesn't mean that none of them will die in season two. But, um, yeah, I think we've covered in, in our talking about the different areas, we've covered some of the things that we think are going to happen. Um, well, why don't I 
put this one to you, 444, uh, saying, what do you think about how the show wrote female characters? This is, for me, one of the most disappointing aspects of the mm. show. Uh, the the um, 444 did give a, a bit more, a sort of few examples there uh, about trying to show empowered women, uh, but perhaps pushing it too far. So why was Bronwyn in charge of defence of the village when you've got Adam Deer there, who presumably has got better technical knowledge, things like that. Um, but I'd love your, rather than me as a man saying, well, this is how they uh, they portrayed women, I'd love to hear your take uh, first on how, how, for you, how do you think that the, the, the writing of women was done? It was pretty good. You know, it makes me think of, um, it, it should be a non-issue. I mean, we talk about the Bechdel test, you know, is there a scene in a movie where two women talk with no men present and they don't talk about men? Well, there kind of was. There was the Muriel Galadriel scene where it was just the two of them talking about politics and power. So that was kind of cool. Um, I think what I liked is that I didn't feel particularly they were writing female characters I just thought they were writing characters and that is as it should be you know I was reading recently about Dorothy L Sayers saying she got tired of being asked you know as a woman writer or as a female writer and she'd said at one point something like um you might as well ask me what is a female triangle or a female square or you know so I personally felt like they were just writing characters and that Galadriel was an interesting troubled profound maybe we liked her story up maybe we didn't but she was just a character it didn't matter that she was female um obviously with Bronwyn it mattered somewhat because she has a relationship with Arondia but again I didn't see it as particularly important to me that therefore must be good writing of female characters if the female characters are written in traditional female roles where they are subservient where they, you know, don't fight, where they cook dinner and wait for the men to come home. That's less interesting, although some people in any society have to cook dinner. Mm. Um, but it, but I, for me, because I wasn't particularly noticing it as female writing, that makes it good female writing to me. I just thought they were characters. Um, the one bit with Bronwyn that didn't sit right with me was how quickly she and everybody else just accepted Halbrand as their king. It yeah. was so weird. It was just like, oh, yeah, he has this bag that has this symbol on it. All right, hail king. And she just ceded her power. And I did think mm, if she was a male character, would she have just given up her power that readily? Did they write it that way because she was female? But for the most part, I think they did a pretty good job of just writing them as characters and the fact that they were female was an aspect of their character but it didn't define their character and that is what I think that kind of you know that's what we would hope writing would be going forward. Yeah and I think um, one thing that I liked uh, was with say Disa who was in many ways taking on this kind of traditional female role that sort of Tolkien often gets accused of having sort of traditional female roles of, of just this, this is the mother and the wife and the person who does the cooking. And she did seem to have all of those aspects to her character. She was there talking about what food she was going to be cooking for Durin. And um, uh, clearly she had a role there in looking after the kids uh, while he was off doing whatever it was. But she also, she seemed to be a rounded character as well. She, she, mm. was, she was there... Um, uh, she had her role doing the singing um, to the mountain, which I thought was beautiful. Um, she clearly uh, had the, I love the scene when she was there at the forge, clang, clang, clang like that, just letting out a bit of anger because that was, that was quite a, a rounded thing to do. And that showed what she was feeling without her just having to be like saying, oh, I'm angry Durin. Um, uh, so I thought I, I really liked that as a sort of a character that could take on the, more traditional role but without losing a sort of an independence of character i think the only other thing i would say is that just thinking about it now pretty much all the female characters apart from nori and poppy's relationship and now nori's gone off with the stranger but they all were paired up with a male character 
and that is maybe mm. a little disappointing maybe Muriel wasn't I don't know it's hard to make generalizations but you know Bronwyn is with Arondir Aerian ends up sort of dating Kem and Galadriel is with Halbrand. um you don't see a female character just sort of forging out on her own um I don't know. I mean, it's a, it becomes a thorny issue. I, it, nothing stuck out for me as being particularly bad. And I know there are people out there who disagree with me and feel <laughs> like the female characters were badly written. And that is an absolutely valid opinion. But uh, I was I, nothing. I didn't hate apart from Aerian having her dinner date with Kevin, where I was just like, oh, please. Um, I didn't feel that women were demeaned by the writing for female characters in this show. Okay. Well, I will take that as a good thing. Uh, quick question from my T fam saying, hi, Robert, thanks for your coverage of season one. Uh, will you be covering Wings of Power going forward? Um, uh, yes, I will actually. Uh, what I will say is that um, I enjoyed it for all the critique that we can come up with on this. I always have to come back to the fact, did I enjoy the show? And I did. I actively wanted to find out what happened next episode. So, uh, yeah, I will be. I will Between now and then, I will be just doing my pure talking videos, uh, as I have been before. Uh, so uh, so that's going to be carrying on. But, uh, yeah, I will when it happens. Who knows where, where I'll be. I, I might have been uh, destroyed in a, in a dust cloud from an exploding mountain or something by then. Who knows? But, um, uh, yes, the, the intention is to, to carry on covering it in the future. That is an interesting uh, question, though, as to when will there be more? That uh, you know, there's there is supposedly now a two-year hiatus before we have more. Yes, and for those who uh, have missed out on these announcements, they have started production of season two. This was a couple of weeks ago. Um, they they started that, which is probably means filming. Uh, they've certainly got the actors on set. Uh, we've certainly seen they have started. I don't do uh, sort of set leaks and things like that on this channel but th they have started coming out so they have been making uh, sets uh, and uh, pictures are now out there of, of the sets so um how long it will take it's quite hard to say i can't see it happening before 2024 myself um uh, they did say two years the showrunners did in an offhand way and in sort of say we'll be with this doing this for the next couple of years um how long will it take to film? I can't say they could film it in less than eight to nine months. And then yeah. post-production, last time was epic length of 13 months. Uh, I don't think it'll be that long, but it will still take a while. It's very bizarre to me that they've allowed this to lag in this way, in that they could have started filming much sooner for the next season, I would have thought. We knew that they were moving the filming to the UK. They were already establishing it there early this year, and then nothing happened. Now, I know they had a lot of the cast off doing press junkets and everything for this season, but it seems very strange to me that they waited this long because it's going to make this massive gap, even if they pull out all the stops to go as fast as they can. And if any momentum that they may have built up is going to dissipate and i wonder if it shows um a an insecurity about their own product i wonder if they were hanging back to see how some of the things they did in season one went down so mm. that they could change things if they wanted to i mean that's just purely conjecture i have no idea that that's the case but it just makes me think why did they not start on season two sooner? Were they waiting to see how people reacted to season one? And are we going to see script changes? We Obviously, we won't know that they're changes, but are things going to change based on the feedback that they're hearing from people like yourself, Robert, or from the fans out there? And I mean, I don't know, but it seems strange to me that they've waited. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, it's always hard because on the outside, speculating about why why something didn't happen a uh, certain sure. time i i've heard rumors that kind of make sense which is that having moved the whole setup from new zealand over to um studios just outside london uh they then obviously they had to get established which does take a bit of time uh but also uh the 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 background jobs 
that you don't really think about, but the, the people who are doing the technical stuff, the support, um, the, the costume creation, the, the set production, that kind of thing, which is skilled work, um, is actually, uh, although there are many people in the UK who can do these things, we've got so many things being filmed in the UK around that part of the world that are very similar. House of the Dragon is being filmed mm -hmm. around that part of the world. The Witch is being filmed around that part of the world. Uh, if you go up to Scotland, Amazon have got a whole load of other things uh, like Anansi Boys, um, Good Omens 2. Uh, so for the sci-fi fantasy experts in all of these kind of supportive industries, um, actually... It, it might take a while to get new people up and running or poach people from other places. So yeah. that I, I heard that that was, that was an issue. Um, I don't know whether that was why there was the delay, um, but I, they should be trying to push for it as soon as possible. I would agree completely. Um, the, the season one, they took as, as long as they wanted um, that was the impression I got. They thought they, they're going to take do everything exactly the right way, however long it took, however much money it took. Uh, season two, they have to just start, you know, getting into uh, some sort of a rhythm. But I, I don't expect it before 2024. It, I can't see them turning it around within a year, um, put it that way. I will find it interesting to see what they do next year with all the conventions and things, because, you know, that's where we do a lot of the One Ring is showing up at conventions and meeting with the fans and doing panels and things. And I think Amazon will try in a year of no new show to, I wouldn't be surprised if they try to have a presence at conventions to try and sort of keep some energy going in whatever kind of fan base they have built up at this point. And as we said right at the beginning of the two hours, they have not as far as I can tell, built an obsessive, you know, mm -hmm. um, really bought into it fan base. But there are lots of people out there who, like you and me, are, have enjoyed the show. And I think it will be interesting to see what they do PR-wise in, in next year to try and keep that enthusiasm for the show warm so that they don't have to start from the ground up again when they start their PR for season two. Yes. And uh, I mean, I think they will be doing stuff at uh, Comic Con and things like that. Um, they have just launched a podcast, an official podcast um, uh, with Fel Felicia Day, who's hosting that. Uh, so they are doing things. Um, but uh, without getting into too much detail about this, it's certainly been noticeable there has been less associated merchandise than perhaps we were expecting when we we heard that amazon were there doing this i think we all expected it would be everywhere you wouldn't be able to move for uh, uh rings of power lunch boxes and uh, and sponsored stuff um and funko pops and things like that but that's been a lot slower to get off of the ground so um uh, yeah there, there's a lot more work that needs to be done on that i think i've got one more question from my patrons um uh, to go um, uh, Marley, I think I think we picked up on your question about what's going to happen in the five seasons of the show. Um, but 444 uh, saying, if you could list three things that you should definitely keep, they think that you should definitely keep for the next season, and three things that must definitely change, what would you choose? For me, to keep is music, uh, the New Zealand landscapes, and thirdly, the dwarves and Adar. Three to change, the showrunners. Um, uh, because they only like mystery boxes, um, uh, the scenes, what was the other thing? Um, uh, this show deserves more, like all the scenes in the entire third. Da, da, da. I can't actually see what the other things were that you said you wanted to uh, to change. But what would you, um, uh, apologies that I may, may have uh, <laughs> not copied across all of your message, but Kirsten, uh, if you could the, pick three things to keep, and three things to change for, for season two, what would they be? Um, okay. I don't know if this means change as in we can change them retrospectively or we have to only change them going forward. I, I think but... changing them going forward. I think let's assume well, season one keep, has happened. I would keep the cast. And mm -hmm. this is unusual for me because, you know, I'm, I'm really fussy about, and I, I always, I'm going to break my own rule here because I always hate people who go, well, as a professional, blah, 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 and sound pretentious, but I do work in theatre as a stage director, and so I do tend to be a bit of an ass about 
I don't like that person's <laughs> interpretation not. of that role, right? And and there was nobody in Rings of Power where I was like, oh, that's just bad acting. So keep the cast. Unusually for me, there's no one I would replace in a role. Um, I agree about the music. I love Ben McCreary's music, and I love what it's doing. I didn't love the song. I, I think I'd change that. I'll, I'll go get a different theme song, which I'm sure we will anyway for each season. We'll probably have a different closing song a la mm. Peter Jackson. But I didn't love that Fiona Apple song. But keep the music, yes. Keep the cast. Um, and, oh, I don't know. Keep the cute Harfoots. Um, <laughs> for change... Yeah. Um, so I've already said different song, but I think we'll get a different song anyway. I think that will happen. The main thing that I would change is I would really like the showrunners not to feel beholden to Peter Jackson. And this is a tough one because a huge number of people in the fan base want to see Peter Jackson's Middle Earth. And before we saw anything in Rings of Power, a lot of people were like, it better look like Peter Jackson's Narsal and it better look like Peter Jackson's Sauron. And, it, you know, um, and a lot of the backlash before we saw anything, a lot of things that people didn't like were because it didn't look like Peter Jackson enough. Now, for me, I wish they didn't feel the need to tie it in quite so much. There are too many... It's not even about the visuals. There are too many scenes. I mean, look at the horse goes to rescue supposedly dead hero and brings him back. Mm. You know, it's like they've just lifted a scene that Peter Jackson had in his movies and transplanted it into theirs. Some of them almost verbatim dialogue. Theo saying, I'm to be sent with the women and children into the caves. Oh, no, that was what uh, Eowyn said. But it was the same scene, basically, you know. So... It's interesting to me. I get it. We loved Peter Jackson's movies, Hobbit movies, but Lord of the Rings movies, yay. Um, and we love those visuals. We love what Weta did. We love how New Zealand looks totally. But if we had had Del Toro's Hobbit instead of Peter Jackson's Hobbit, we would have seen a completely different take on Middle Earth. And whether we would have liked it or not, we would not now be in this place where there is only Peter Jackson's way of doing things. And I wish the showrunners would have a little more courage to say, no, this is our version of Middle Earth. Of course, looking at Tolkien, but what we're putting on screen is our version, not Peter Jackson's version. So that would be my key change is stop worrying about PJ. Did okay. I miss three? I can't remember. Good enough. <laughs> no, well, I mean, you, you gave good answers, and that's that's all we really care about. I, so, I mean, I think for me, <coughs> pardon me, three things that I would love to keep. Um, the first is uh, the visual. I mean, this sort of jars with what you're saying a moment ago, I suppose. But the visual landscape, things like Casa Doom, uh, things like Numenor, even stuff that didn't get much attention, Eregion. I thought looked great. I thought if if but for the other things that were there, I would probably be saying, yeah, that's exactly how I imagine Oregon to be. So I think the visual landscape it felt like Middle Earth to me, and I thought, perfect. I will I will happily keep that as a as a whole. I take your your view on you know the what Sauron looks like and things like that. Maybe they they could shift those around. But in terms of the feel of Middle Earth itself, the visual landscape there, uh, music, I would agree with you completely. I think that. Bear McCreary did an outstanding job, so I would definitely keep that. Um, the other thing I would keep, um, and I think 444, I'm probably just echoing the things you said, but some of those characters, the, the, the dwarves and Adar, I think were brilliant. I, I want more Adar. I want more of the, the, the lives of the dwarves within Khazad Doom. I want that really expanded out. In terms of stuff I would change, um, I went on my mini rant earlier about Mystery Box. I think I just just the story. Um, we don't have to have it like uh, as a mystery uh, to revealed to us at different. But just allow the story to be told. That's the way that Tolkien uh, told stories. Just uh, let it breathe. I would say um, 
I would change, bring some of the characters back closer to where, where they are in the books like Gil Galad I talked about earlier. I would love him to return to be this great, wise and powerful uh, king. Um, mm. uh, and uh, the third thing, I think I scribbled it down somewhere. What's the third thing I would change? Um, oh, yeah, the attention to detail. Um, the Just the small things. And I think 444, you did mention this as well. But stuff like... Um, uh, a character having a near mortal wound in one scene and then the next day seeming seemingly all right and wandering around and doing lots of stuff or um, uh, Halbrand being too too sick to travel um, and be treated on a cart journey down to Pelagia but hey why don't we put him on a horse for a 500 mile gallop that 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 kind of thing just it jars and i and it it's needed more in my view it's needed more this attention to detail in fantasy than it is in most other genres because yeah. we have to suspend our disbelief but to, to know there are things out there's elves and dragons and dwarves and all of the rest of it but the internal coherence of the story has to work we have to believe that the stakes are there if somebody if if random example Bronwyn is stabbed and it, blood is literally pouring out from her wound we have to believe that that she could have died there yeah we can't have her literally like afterwards wandering around sort of happily cheering the king and uh, uh and and uh healing other people and doing big hair, bear hugs with Theo she we have to believe that she was actually properly um, uh, hurt. So that kind of just internal coherence and integrity to yeah. the story. Um, um, a friend of mine has a saying, which I think is a good one. He says, Superman cannot flush a gun down the toilet. And I kind of like that, <laughs> the idea that, you okay. know, there are many things that Superman can do, but he lives on earth and if he throws a gun down the toilet and flushes it that gun ain't gonna flush away and i don't know why my friend picked that as his analogy but i think it's a good one to be like there are certain things we will accept and there are certain things that have to be consistent and cohesive and without that it kind of the fabric of the world that we're creating starts to unravel yes and it did take me back i have to admit to game of thrones season seven or whatever it was when i suddenly got hugely obsessed by the uh, the flying speed of dragons and, uh, and and things like that because there was an internal coherence issue that i just had to explain to people about why daenerys would not have reached to a certain point at a certain time and it was just like uh, but this actually matters it really matters in this um, uh, just, but, to, just to clarify sorry but what, i just wanted to clarify from seeing what i saw in the chat when i said before i didn't like the song i didn't mean howard shaw's theme music i meant the fiona apple song that we just heard at the end of the finale love howard shaw's theme music love bear mccreary's music did not like the song that was bear mccreary with fiona apple at the end of the finale yeah that did seem to divide people a bit it was very strong vocals um uh, and i it did take me back however to um and it seems bizarre to, to me now to recall but i didn't like the annie lennox song um that was there the return of the king the first time i heard it i thought "Ooh, that's annie lennox why she that she's she doesn't belong in middle earth and i couldn't quite it did it took me two or three years now i love it and i think it's beautiful um so i i hope that same thing happens with this song um but yeah it it felt for me it was a little jarring because the the vocals were so strong I wanted them to be slightly quieter. I don't know. Um, you're you're the music person, not me. But that's just uh, <laughs> is, um, uh, the uh, that was my my feel. But um, uh, let's uh, let's round that. I think that's all my questions there from uh, my patrons. Was there anything else in the chat that you wanted to pick up on? I don't think so. I, I, I noted a couple of things as we went that, that people said that entertained me um, or, you know, I've, I've, it goes by very quickly, as you say, the chat. But I like seeing people's remarks and I like that we all have different opinions and we can agree to disagree. Um, so it's just cool. And I admire people's wit and knowledge and sense of humor. So I've been enjoying seeing some of the comments that, that people have been writing whilst we've been chatting. Well, the, the quality of the people in the chat is exceptionally high, it has to be said. Um, and um, 
the moderators again i should probably say i saw part way through that you did have to zap a few comments as well so thank you very much for that uh but if people want a bit more custom in their lives if people want uh more yeah. one ring where where on the internet should they go well if you're interested in the one ring you can go to the one ring.net and um if you see articles published there under the name of green dragon it is i um we also do have a Discord and there are message boards and the One Ring has an active Facebook group and, you know, all the usual uh, social things that you might expect. We're often at conventions and we love seeing folks there. There's a lot of us who volunteer with the One Ring, so it's um, just fun to meet up and have social events together and things like that. If you are interested in opera and theatre, you can come and see my show. You can check out enigmachamberopera.org. Um, I also have a show in New York at the beginning of November. So if you're in New York, I'm, it's not opera, it's rock and blues, but based on Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own. So that's an interesting combination. Um, so that's going to be at 54 Below, which is Studio 54 in New York on the 5th of November. Um, but yeah, the easiest place to find me is to either look for enigmachamberopera.org or look for just Kirsten, middle initial Z or Z for any Americans watching Cairns. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. It's been an absolute delight having you on. Uh, some really uh, interesting perspectives uh, just to sort of add into it. And that wasn't a euphemism. Was it? That was an interesting perspective. I, I, I think there was a lot of extra um, uh, ways of looking at this that I haven't come across uh, before, which I hugely appreciate. Um, but I will make you disappear for just one moment so I can point at things. If you're watching this back a little bit later, uh, appearing somewhere around here, will be a link to other um, live streams that I've done appearing somewhere around here soon will be a link to my patreon page um i will be back uh, on sunday for episode 10 of house of the dragon my pre-show live stream there so that one's coming to an end as well um thank you so much to everyone who donated today i hugely appreciate that um, um we're, we're doing excellent hopefully we might hit seven thousand by the end of uh end of the season uh for house of the dragon that would be wonderful wonderful That's a great, thank you a great cause your alzheimer's cause one of the other things i do is i specialize in doing concerts for people with alzheimer's because music is a great uh not a healer but a great way of reaching and connecting with people who are suffering from dementia so um, it's a great cause that you're raising money for there excellent well thank you very much um and it is indeed and you, you, yes on music absolutely uh, people with dementia it's one of the things that helps connect some synapses uh, a lot for for people with uh, with dementia and, and alzheimer's uh but i will be back on sunday thank you so much uh, uh for everyone in the chat moderators kirsten take care everyone and i will see you again soon <laughs>